Coming up, it's our annual end-of-the-year wrap-up of the big stories from this week in computer hardware, including the Meltdown Spectre Fallout, PC Purr's Over the Top, Red Ripper 1950X Plex Server, the Oculus Go, which is about watching movies, not VR, Brian Krasanich's resignation from Intel, Huawei's benchmark cheating, NVIDIA's ray tracing mayhem with the RTX 2080 and 2070, the failure of SSD encryption, and so much more. Stay tuned. It has been a huge year in hardware. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 497, recorded for December 27, 2018. The year's biggest stories in hardware. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by On Deck. Are you a small business owner in need of capital today? Well, On Deck can help. With over $10 billion in loans and an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau, On Deck is a lender you can trust. Visit ondeck.com slash twitch to learn more and receive a free consultation with one of their U.S.-based loan specialists. Happy holidays, everybody. Patrick Norton here. Alan is hopefully on a beach somewhere or doing whatever it is Alan does when he's on vacation, which oddly enough, I think is mostly visiting historical sites and driving race cars really fast. But I didn't tell you that because he's a man who's a little secret. If you're feeling a little secret right now, if you're hiding off, just getting some chill time away from the rest of the family over the holidays. I got something for you. We're going to take a look. Well, we're just going to drop some of the big stories of 2018, the stuff that happened in hardware for you to enjoy. Thank you so much for listening to Twitch. Over the year, we can't wait to see you in 2019. Some of my favorite conversations at CES involved like, well, I don't have to worry about, you know, Meltdown Inspector. And I'm like, well, actually, everything but the Apple Watch and your wrist that you own in your backpack right now has to worry about Meltdown Inspector patches. Um, you know, and that was a big admission for, for Apple to be like, yep, it impacts everything but the watch. Uh, patches are yeah. in line. Patches, I and mean, we talked about it pretty extensively beforehand. Where basically, you know, Windows, Linux, OS 10, uh, iOS, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, the patches were in place or in the process of being rolled out. What's, uh, you know, we saw some early numbers that indicated for the last, cu- at least the last couple generations of processors, the differences in the before and after on the patch would be indetectable. With the suggestion that uh, as you went farther and farther back towards, say, 1995, the more of a performance hit you would see. Um, nothing we've seen reported anywhere nearly like a 30% before and after. And it's tough, right? Because if you didn't have before benchmarks and Windows automatically applied your update, you're probably going to have difficulties doing a before and after. Um, yeah. But what's going on with uh, storage performance? So the, the, the interesting thing that came up, and this was when we were first discovering uh, what this security vulnerability was all about was, was our, was our theory that it would affect storage performance the most because um, you know, uh, applications that are constantly asking for storage requests or are doing a lot of network transfers are, you know, those, those user space applications are essentially asking the kernel to do something every time. So you have to do these user space kernel space switches very frequently Um, with the revised patches and microcode stuff. This essentially equates to clearing these these TLB caches, these these page uh, uh, page tables more frequently, which should result in lower total performance. Um, what so Alan, this is right before we left for CES actually did a couple of spot checks on some testing and uh, because there had been a couple of reports came out that saw some performance drops uh, in storage performance testing. So we looked at what we think would be one of the worst case scenarios, 4K random uh, testing. Uh, but we looked at it on a SATA SSD, an NVMe SSD, and then an Optane product as well. And if, if you can't really understand the graphs that you're looking at, the essential takeaway here is that um, the 960 for Evo, the NVMe part, got slower after the patch. However, the Optane drive and the SATA drive got faster after the patch had lower latency on these what? particular uh, benchmarks. Right. Um, so if you're a, if you were a, a site, an outlet that did testing and you just said, oh, we're going to test storage, we're going to test, um, you know, a 960 pro or 960 Evo because it's the fastest thing that they had available to them. And it made the most sense. Sure. Um, you would see that performance drop. However, by throwing in a SATA drive and something even significantly faster than the 960s, uh, we see the performance gains. Now, do I believe that the patches 
for Meltdown Inspector caused this speed increase? I don't. I think there's probably other things that have changed in uh, you know, either Microsoft's inbox driver or other stuff that uh, changes with, you know, Redstone 4 from Redstone 3 um, that that may have caused that. And we're kind of seeing a, you know, combined effect, if you will. So maybe performance would have been more better uh, on Redstone 4 mm -hmm. without this patch uh, than it was with it. So that, that definitely caused some confusion and it, and it basically indicated to me that we were a fair distance away from truly understanding what the impact was going to be of a bunch of these things. Um, and, and that's, you know, that that's kind of good news for Intel uh, and AMD and all their parties involved because the assumption has been for a while that things were going to be really bad. Uh, mm -hmm. However, I think they now we kind of, it feels like they intentionally led with the worst case scenario so that the, you know, the people who had spent a whole bunch of money in the last couple of years would feel really good about the results they saw. Which were negative. Well, uh, those initial results. Oh, you're talking about the the best case scenario being the negligible performance. And um, I think you're probably right. Right? They wanted that to be the kind of uh, preceding message to everything else. Um, but if you look at so even today, for example, Intel released some information on a couple of things. One, um, these patches have been causing random reboots on some oops. systems, uh, which is bad. Um, Initially reported as a Haswell Broadwell problem, Intel's now confirmed that the rebooting issue actually affects everything up through Cabby Lake. Um, they're still trying to uh, figure out what specifically is causing that, but they promise to have an update available next week to try to address some of that stuff. Um, so now you're dealing with consumers or enterprise customers that don't want to install these security patches because they need the stability of their system to be at a certain level. And now maybe that's that's put in question. Um, the performance side, which is if you go back up a little bit to that table, you'll see that Intel basically put out their own testing uh, of what they've been able to find. And that ranges from as low as a 0% impact to as much as an 18% impact. Um, the 0% uh, or, or close to it, like low single digits, is something that is CPU intensive, um, like integer testing, floating point testing, uh, Linpack, stream testing. These are, are very CPU heavy tests that don't leave the user space, right? And they represent some specific workloads. They did a, um, you know, server-side Java. They did an OLTP, which is an online transaction uh, benchmark, uh, basically emulating a bro brokerage service. And that saw about 3.9, 4% reduction in performance. So, you know, something that you might worry about if you're on the bleeding edge of stuff, but not enough to to maybe cause us to to run around and, and with our hair, hair on fire. Um, no, mm -hmm. they did they did FIO testing, which is storage specific testing, looking at 4K random, just like we kind of looked at earlier, um, and saw interesting results. One is at 100% read, like doing the read testing, there was no performance change, but your CPU utilization went up 22%. Whoa. Right, went up 22 points. Uh, on the right performance, it actually, your CPU only went up 2%. CPU utilization only went up 2%, but you dropped 18% in maximum performance, right? So it's actually kind of interesting to think about, um, even if you have a 0% performance drop, like they did on their store, like purely synthetic, 100% read performance, they didn't see any performance drop, but a 22% CPU utilization uh, hike is pretty substantial. And it tells us two things. One, it kind of gives you an idea of the importance of the uh, speculative execution progress that was made in CPU design over the last decade. And also, mm -hmm. um, if you're applying these patches, just because you think your workload doesn't see any performance deficit as your workload on that system increases, again, this is more for data center type enterprise uh, applications, you know, you may have to upgrade that server sooner or uh, supplement that machine sooner than you would have otherwise. So, you know, if you're if you're an IT manager, <clears throat> you have 20 database servers um, that you have to worry about reads from, and they all happen to because of other applications that are running, other services that are running on them. You're you were comfortably running at an 80% CPU utilization most of the time. Applying these patches may put you over that threshold where you start to see some some impact. Um, so it, it's interesting to see another uh, angle to have to monitor and measure and look for uh, mm -hmm. across the board there. But, you know, Intel is 
this is the most uh, open they have been about this performance story thus far. Uh, it's a change from kind of their initial stance on things. They were very cagey, very closed. A lot of uh, you know the CEO going out on TV and saying, "Oh, everything's fine here. Uh, it'll be everything's going to be fixed in a week. We don't see any potential big performance impacts." And then now they're they're showing some of this stuff. So is it end of world mentality? Still no. Uh, but is it much more important that we watch it? I think I think it is for consumers. I still believe that. This is a this is a close to a net zero problem, right? For for gamers, for consumers that are on a laptop or on their PC doing normal normal type tasks, it's when you get into heavy virtualization, heavy uh, I/O intensive application workloads uh, that you may have to start to worry. And and that was backed up by um, I had a couple other links in there. You know, Red Hat hosted um, some of their performance metrics, and they you know said they tested in a range as high as eight to nineteen percent. For again, online transaction workloads, um, net perf, you know those types of things, but it was minimal to single digits for high performance computing and uh, those types of workloads. In full disclosure, Red Hat is a sponsor on the Twit Network. So, and then Epic Games posted something in their blog about their servers that they have for um, Fortnite. Basically, that that line at the top there is the change in CPU utilization after applying the patch. Right, so you can see they jump from right. essentially, you know, 18 to 42 percent uh, increase there, and that kind of makes sense because essentially all this server is doing is moving data around through a network, um, which is again one of those worst case scenarios. So there, there are still a lot of things to look out for, um, and that will be interesting to to discuss, I guess. Yeah, interesting is a, a gracious word for it. I mean. It, I, I had tweeted out about how, you know, sort of Google, Amazon, blah, 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 have to be freaking out about this. And and somebody's like, well, why would Google be freaking out? You know, they, they help discover this. And it's like, well, yeah, but even if you help discover and sort of work out the fix for a security problem like this, you still got, I mean, how many millions of servers or how many millions of, or tens of millions? I mean, I, I can't, you know, there's, it's probably a staggering number of processors, you know, Intel and AMD processors that Google runs at this yeah. point, uh, literally yeah. scattered around the world. Even if you're part of the team that discovers this, even if you're in on the ground level and in, in sort of working on, on the repairs, you still have to deploy these patches over millions of machines. And then you have to find out how it's impacting you. And, you know, I mean, for Epic, does this mean they're going to have to double the number of machines that they run, you know, at peak times to deliver the same performance? Well, that gets expensive. You know, this is... I don't know. Uh, you know, this is. I think this is messy, and will continue to evolve whether we want it to or not. Um, yeah. The last one of the last things I want to mention, uh, because I think we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, was: <laughs> Are people going to change CPU architectures? Is is design going to have to revert fifteen years? Um, and I and I still believe that's not the case. I did have a couple of interesting talks with some uh, high level guys at Intel and ARM and and AMD that just said. You know, they don't imagine there is going to be dramatic shifts in the roadmap, but it's impossible right. to believe that there won't be some shifts in roadmaps because of it, right? People are right. are now more cognizant. We'll see more additions um, to to things like the uh, process context IDs that that many of these fixes center around that Intel, you know, put in and has well and then updated in, uh, I don't know which one, Skylake maybe. Um, more expansion in that area, I think, is what we'll see in the in the future. Although, like, I don't think next generation's architectures are going to have time to shift. These have been taped out. These have been finished. Um, well, that was so, I mean, that was one of the funny funnier questions I got about the AMD processors that were announced at, at CES. And somebody was like, "Well, you know, are these are these fixed?" We're like, no. They just got finished. They were just taped out. They're just going to vendors. I mean, they, they, right. these designs were locked in stone before this was even, you know, uh, before this was revealed internally, much less externally. Um, yep. I mean, are we talking about three to five years before we see any meaningful um, changes in architecture? I, I think that's probably pretty pretty accurate. I think if they were super aggressive, um, maybe two. Uh, you know, I because these BIOS updates that we're getting, they're updating microcode, which is essentially a software layer between the processor and, and the rest of the components. Um, right. Think of it as the only kind of firmware updatable location 
in uh, the system. Those, you know, going forward, all of those will have that kind of stuff pre-installed, um, pre, you know, ready to go out of the box. Um, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, will future motherboards have an option to turn off or enable, disable some of these some of these security features in order to improve performance for people that are less concerned about it. I think that's probably right. a negative in the long run to risk your security due to anything. Um, but I, I would also not be surprised well, if, if. Go ahead. I was going to say, if, if you know, if uh, you know, at this point we haven't seen it really exploited in the wild, but part of me keeps thinking, like, boy, all it takes is a little bit of you know, one popular app on ARM platforms. And this could get really interesting really fast. I mean, you know, we've yeah. we've talked about tens of millions of unpatched XP machines or or Linux boxes. I mean, this is this is a vector to exploit. And if people go out of their way to you know sort of bot <laughs> together, um, <coughs> pardon me, people go out of their way to 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 assemble you know millions of incredibly low powered you know uh, chips inside of traffic cameras or security cameras. Imagine what getting this kind of level of low access to unpatched systems. You know, it's going to be it's going to be catnip for an entire category of of nefarious individual on the internet. Um, yeah, I, I'm, yeah. You know, it'll be interesting to see like where the first big exploit is and 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 who it impacts. Um, I think. Yep, it's going to be a lot of people. Uh, I just think it's going to be less than the than they're fearful. Uh, uh, initial like 24 hour cycle led us to believe. <laughs> what were you thinking? Or what was Jim thinking? Um, he built a Plex server with an AMD Ryzen Threadripper 1950X. This just seems delightfully over the top. I mean, was he thinking about re rendering 4K video on the fly to multiple, uh, uh, to multiple, uh, devices simultaneously or did you guys finally kind like of. well we can't use this thread ripper you know for <laughs> video capture let's use it to build the the server from hell um this is just um, awesome so and slightly ridiculous it is so yeah you don't need this kind of power if you have a a, a plex server that you're using for just you right and in fact right. like the nvidia shield acts as a Plex server and it's just fine it actually does surprisingly well um even for like single stream Transcodes, but let's say you had an office with a big shared group of people. Uh, you have a gigabit internet connection, and you thought, well, why don't we just pool all of our data, all of our all of our media into one collection, uh, right. and then we can just all share it out from there. Now, when you do that, and now all of a sudden, my wife might be watching something, I might be watching something, my daughter, et cetera, et cetera, you extend out. Now, all of a sudden, you have the possibility of there being a significant quantity of streams running at the same time. So, hence the power. Of something like a Ryzen Threadripper processor, 16 cores, 32 threads. Um, the that was the the idea for the build is we wanted a lot of compute power because that server also acts as the file server for our, our office network as well. Okay. Um, in theory, we could probably serve simultaneously 10 to 11 Plex users off of that machine based on performance estimates that Jim came up with. Um, uh huh. The other, the other interesting part about this platform, other than the Ryzen build, is where we got all the hard drives. Uh, there are 16 8 terabyte hard drives in there, Russian digital reds, that came wow. from being shucked from external <laughs> enclosures, right? So we didn't ask Russian digital for these drives. We bought all this stuff. Uh, and the, the you know, the, while, while a bare 8 terabyte red was probably 250, 280 at the time we were doing this project. Uh -huh. Sometimes you could find these external eight terabyte drives for one hundred and fifty dollars, and if you were just willing to break apart some plastic, you could got a fully compatible, you know, Western Digital Red hard drive inside this enclosure. And if you do that thirty two times, you get thirty two hard drives, as the picture on that website uh, unfortunately shows. Now, I think only sixteen of those ended up in our server. Sixteen of those ended up in Alan's server. That's just the kind of guy he is, right? Um, <laughs> But it was an interesting project for that regard. The, on the Plex side, you know, we we Jim goes through some more details on like the operating system we use. We ended up using Windows 10 for this. We're using an Arica hardware RAID card for the 16 hard drives. Um, you know, there's free NAS and other options that we could have gone into. Uh, most of the problems we found with that surrounded the fact that the, the, the Plex server for other alternative operating systems tend to lag behind in features and updates. Right. 
So if you wanted the Plex server that had the most recent updates all the time, you just wanted a Windows machine. Um, <clears throat> it also made our kind of <clears throat> file sharing in the office much easier. Everybody else is on Windows machines. So Windows file sharing just worked better that way as opposed to having to get involved with cross-operating system um, shares. So uh, it was a really interesting project. Uh, it's a 10 gigabit networking base. So we, you know, we get the throughput we need out of that. The only hiccup being the, the, the RAID card seems to be a little bit slower than we expected. Like it's kind of like 700 megabytes per second, even with all those drives, but way better than what we were getting on our gigabit network and um, uh, file server before just from doing bulk copies across, across the network. So um, should be interesting. We've been using it for a while. Everything seems to be successful. And it's it's one of those projects that, you know, we said, hey, what what can you really utilize a Threadripper processor for if you're not doing content creation type, massive right. multitasking uh, type things? And I think a, a, media, a, a dedicated media transcode server, which is essentially what Plex does, made a lot of sense. Drayton Williams tweets, any plans to talk about the Ryzen 24G? APU at Ryan Shroud at Patrick Norton. Benchmark leaks are looking promising. And it just so happens, ladies and gentlemen, that the AMD Ryzen 5 2400G and Ryzen 3 2200G review, a.k.a. the return of the APU, is up at PCPer.com. If I want desperately to build a gaming machine and I cannot pony up the staggering cost over MSRP for, uh, you know, a GTX 1070, although I did actually see it at AMD uh, 560 for sale recently for a very short period of time, but it actually was for sale. It's the first time I've seen one for sale in months. Um, it sold out in minutes, but I mean, can I do 3D gaming on one of these uh, Radeon Vega graphics equipped Ryzen 3 or Ryzen 5 APUs? So, uh, yeah, right? So here's, here's the <laughs> about these parts. Yeah, right? they, you know, uh, and they're still $169, $99 processors. So they're not going to you know, blow you out of the water in terms of either CPU or GPU performance. What they do have is they're two to three times faster than the Intel equivalent part in terms of integrated graphics performance, right? So the Core i5-8400, the Core i3-8100, they use Intel you know, Ultra HD Graphics 630. Um, that It just cannot keep up with what the Ryzen 5 2400G and Ryzen 3 2200G can do and you can see there in the specs table you know the, the they both use vega integrated graphics the higher end uses 11 compute units the smaller one uses eight compute units but they're still significantly ahead of the graphics performance there and if you go to the second page where we look at the integrated graphics performance you'll see that it the 2400g is going to run slightly behind like uh, uh, a discrete solution like the nvidia gt 1030 Right, so in a couple of games, it's close to matching it. Uh, yeah, sorry, third page. Uh, in in a handful of games, it's still a little, it's still significantly or noticeably behind, I would say. But it's competitive. Mm -hmm. This is not a a high end gaming solution, but it is a excellent mainstream entry point. I don't know if I would ever tell somebody to build a system on this if they were, you know, if they were looking to buy a 1070 or something like that, but couldn't because of pricing and availability. I don't think you'll be happy with the solution this provides mm -hmm. because if you're looking to buy a 1070, you're probably not looking to play 1080, 1080p low or 720p medium quality right. settings, right? You're probably looking for something quite a bit better than that. However, if you are a, a, a general average consumer um, that is okay with that, or you are building a secondary system, or um, you want to have a, a PC and maybe just you want to play League of Legends, you want to play Overwatch, those types of things. This system will absolutely do it and significantly better than what the Intel platforms will do. And it does so at a significantly lower cost as well, because if you think about so the second thing I'll say about performance is on the CPU side, the Intel parts are are going to be faster most of the time. The Core i5-8400 is a six-core, six-thread part, and the Ryzen 5 2400G is a four-core, eight-thread part. And we already know that the Intel cores have higher IPC, they're better performance per core, per thread, um, than the AMD parts. So the 85, the 8400 from Intel is faster than the 2400G from AMD in CPU tasks, multi-threaded, for the most part, single-threaded, definitely. 
Um, but the what the Ryzen APUs offer now is competitiveness in the CPU space that AMD couldn't offer at all before in an APU, like the seventh gen APU, the Bristol Ridge based stuff that was out before it. So that's a good thing. Um, the the interesting thing also is AMD hasn't been able to address a significant part of the market because think of how many you know, mom and pop computers, small business machines, uh, you still just use the Intel integrated graphics because they're not gaming at all even, but it, so it's just easy to use the integrated graphics on that part. You don't have to buy a discrete solution. Uh, AMD wasn't able to compete with that with its new, better CPU architecture because they didn't have a part that had integrated graphics on it until now. So now they can address that part. If you are a builder and you're like, okay, I want to build a 1080p low, you know, 16 by nine medium setting box before your answer was going to be a core i3 processor. And then you'd have to buy a discrete solution, like a $75, $80 NVIDIA GT 1030. So you were going to pay $120 for the processor, 80 to hundred dollars for that GPU. AMD says, well, now you can get a 2400 G for 169 bucks or even the 2200 G for $99. And you have a significant cost reduction already. And couple that with the fact that there are tons of platforms available for the AMD systems in terms of low cost motherboards, right? right? You've got all those options. You've got, you don't have to use X470. Wait, yeah. You don't have to use an X series board. You can use a, a B series board or even an A series board from these AMD partners. However, if you use a Core i5-8400 or a Core i3-8100, they only have Z series motherboards available that support Coffee Lake parts. So your motherboards are going to be more expensive as well. Um, so AMD has a lot of advantages there. It's right. just, I think it's a little different market than maybe how we had set it up as, right? Like this is not, I, I don't want to put this as a gaming first product. It's more of right. a product that can do gaming. It's, it's kind of AMD's big hurdle right now is they have a, a way right. better integrated graphics part on their processor. Now they have to figure out why people should use it, right? And, and we have this one example <laughs> of mainstream, you know, entry-level gaming. But what are those other use cases? Are there other applications sure. and workloads that, uses that will use the uh, improved graphics performance here uh, above what Intel can provide? We shall see. It's amazing how many motherboards are out now uh, for AMT, uh, like AM4. Yeah. It's just crazy, the number of, especially if you want like mini ITX or micro ATX um, or Pico ATX. It's just, there are tons of options that are worth considering. Mobile World Congress took place uh, this week. Um, very beginning of the week, I want to say Sunday, uh, Samsung dropped the Galaxy S9 and S9 Plus. Um, as uh, Sebastian writes up in PC Per, Samsung unveiled their not so secret Galaxy S9 and S9 Plus smartphones at their unpacked event at Mobile World Congress. Um, you know, <laughs> they had also, I guess, accidentally posted the launch video the day before. So that kind of complicated the surprisey part of things. Um, Snapdragon 845 uh, in the US and China, um, Samsung's. Exynos 9810 Octa and the rest of the world and, uh, you know, camera updates. And in a lot of ways, the reaction to this was, wow, it's like a Samsung S8, except it's got a better camera. Um, dual 12 megapixel real cameras, uh, um, you know, cameras like are at f1.5 or f2.4. The second camera's fixed at f2.4. And the idea is that they're not going to sacrifice daylight performance, but they're going to give you, you know, better performance in low light. Um you know, this is, uh, uh, you know, this is interesting to kind of look at because Samsung, if you care about it, I think it's more of a gimmick, but Samsung was really excited about their super slow-mo, um, which takes 0.2 seconds of video and then stretches it out uh, over six seconds. Um, so it's capturing 960 frames per second uh, in HD, which as far as I'm concerned is a pretty awesome kind of, you know, <laughs> feet to do on something that's sure. in your, you know, if something that'll fit in your pocket. I mean, given that like you can rent a really super serious uh, slow motion camera for say ten, fifteen thousand dollars a day uh, if you're in the right part of the country, to have that level of power inside your phone is pretty outrageous. I just wish it was longer than 0. 0.2 seconds because 0. 0.2 seconds goes by really fast. Um, yeah, you, you know. don't really have a control over that, right? Not so much. 
like it, uh, it, it auto detects for when the motion occurs, which, yeah. you know, sounds great, except you have to trust it to do it when you wanted it to happen. So, yeah, well, but, it, you know, it's an I guess I, like, I guess I would trust the AI more than I would trust my capability to tap the screen at the right time, have the screen react in the appropriate time to to capture what I wanted to capture. I don't know. Yeah. Point two seconds you do, like, is a very to, short, short window. You can do it up to 20 times in a video. I would like to see, you know, could you do it in post? Does it have to be done live? It's, it's, uh, I have not gotten that deep into it because yeah. as exciting as the new cameras are, I'm just not up for spending 720 bucks on a new uh, Android phone <laughs> and then a couple hundred dollars on new uh, on new uh, software to replace all the apps I've, I I use and yep. pay money for on the uh, iOS type of things. Um, Pre-orders are up now uh, up at Samsung's website uh, and March 16th is the release date for both of those. Um, DisplayMate, which is a fantastic uh, website, um, they call themselves the standard for excellence for image and picture quality. Um, my buddy Robert Heron from AVXL, who is a pretty serious, uh, you know, tester of video, uh, loves DisplayMates. Um, they got really, really excited about the Galaxy S9 OLED display, uh, and they flat out, uh, you know, uh, they basically say it is the most advanced. Um, screen they've ever tested the most innovative and high performance display we've ever tested with the highest absolute color accuracy and peak brightness um they are super excited about this um you know and they basically flat out you know say that oled displays have tremendous performance advantages over lcds so high-end and flagship smartphones need oled displays in order to compete at state-of-the-art performance levels securing oled as the definitive premier display technology for the top tier smartphones in the foreseeable future for the next three to five years and they get really in-depth in their analysis uh of the phone um they're basically saying it's Virtually indistinguishable from perfect in terms of the absolute color accuracy. Um, the high brightness mode is 20% brighter than the Galaxy S8. Um, you know, they said they had record small shifts in brightness and color with a viewing angle, including white. Um, you know, it's certified by the UHD Alliance for Mobile HDR Premium. It just goes on and on and on, including, uh, like we've seen in some other phones on the Android side of things recently, uh, user adjustable white points. Um this is pretty exciting uh, if you want to geek out and learn a lot about cell phone uh, screen technology. So congratulations to Samsung. And uh, I can't actually wait to see what that screen looks like, uh, especially after the launch of the Pixel 2 uh, with its oh so blue <laughs> issues. Uh, it's, it's interesting to watch. Samsung uh, is doing some pretty fantastic things. I just thought it was cool. Uh, uh, Lead to review Seasonic's new Prime 600-watt titanium fanless power supply. Um, yeah, this is crazy. It's 600 watts. There's no yeah. fan. It's like, and that's that's a lot of wattage. Unless you're running multiple GPUs um, and a fairly hefty processor, flat out 600 watts is going to be more than enough uh, for the vast majority of humans. Um, you know, and there's not a lot of them out there. But this one's rated 80 plus titanium, and uh, you know, zero DBA, fanless operation. Um, yeah, it's no incredibly moving efficient. Parts. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Lee did his usual incredible array of testing, um, outstanding voltage regulation, low AC ripple, um, a single 12-volt output can deliver up to 50 amps or 600 watts, which is epic, uh, four PCI Express connectors, two 4 plus 4 pin slash 8-pin ATX CPS connectors, a 12-year warranty. I was excited about 10 years. I'm even more excited about 12 years. Um Gold-plated connectors. He says the build quality is excellent. Japanese capacitors. Um, the danger, though, is that you need to have excellent case airflow. So this doesn't eliminate needing air to go through the power supply. It just means the power supply is set up in a way that allows you to, you know, it's it's pretty. There's lots of holes in that enclosure because they want lots of air to move there. And that air is going to move through that uh, power supply enclosure uh, via all those holes inside of it. So you're going to need to have good airflow inside of your case. You're going to have to manage it. Um, and it's not the least expensive power supply <laughs> or as uh, as lee puts it 80 plus titanium efficiency plus fanless equals expensive yeah um, yeah it's definitely expensive we were doing some math it, last night on the like the efficiency combined with like the range of uh mm -hmm. you know wattage and if you were running this thing at like 300 watts or so it's almost 95 percent efficient yeah so 
uh, which is pretty you amazing. Almost, when you, think about it. You, you almost don't even need to worry about having case air moving through it at that point because it's only dissipating like 20 watts or so, which is which is nothing in right. in terms of you know PC uh, heat output, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it could almost just radiate that out with no airflow and still run relatively cool, uh, you know, just on its own. And so, you know, that much surface area with only 20, 25 watts dissipation, it's, it's going to be fine. It could literally just be sitting on a desk out in the open with nothing blowing on it and wouldn't overheat. Um, so just, it's so, interesting to see, you know, that much of a, you know, you have to put really good parts in a power supply like that in order for it to be able to, you know, run at that, at those high wattages with mm-hmm. literally no fan. So, but you're basically saying the math says I don't need to be as paranoid about airflow through the fan as I am. Uh, I would be paranoid. If you wanted to run this at its max, I would be mm-hmm. paranoid. Yeah, because okay. 600 watts, it's going to be dissipating something like 50 watts. Now you're starting to get up there to where things will start cooking if you just let them sit with no airflow. Um, but again, so much surface area that 50 watts even isn't that big of a number as long as there's some small amount of airflow moving over. <laughs> you know. Right. And to give you an idea what that actual cost is, uh, it's not brutally expensive. I mean, if, if it if it only lasts ten of the twelve year warranty, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, uh, twenty bucks a year, one hundred ninety nine dollars and ninety nine, one hundred ninety nine ninety um, from Amazon.com. So that's that's a pretty sweet power supply, uh, you know. And it's it's also funny that we're looking at these really amazing power supplies and being like, that's so expensive. Um, but uh, I guess, you know, compared to a fanned power supply, it is a little pricey. His review entitled Zen Matures, Mr. Ryan Shrout. Well, I don't say it quite like that, but yeah, I guess that comes across. Yeah. Really? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's the next Zen. Yeah, exactly. Essentially. It's, um, this is one of those... So how do I say about this? It is a it's it's actually a surprisingly good product, and I say surprisingly for a couple of reasons. One Ouch. is, uh, well, hold on, wait, wait, wait for the detail. Um, one Damn is it if you phrase. <laughs> exactly, you know, AMD doesn't have a reputation for iterating on processor designs over the last decade, right? Sure. This launch is a success. It does that. Uh, it's not a revolutionary thing like we saw with the Ryzen 1000, but it is evolutionary sure. on the vein that we have kind of seen over the years from uh, Intel. And because mm-hmm. of that, they're proving that they can execute on a roadmap and on a plan and all that all that type of stuff. Um, and I do think it's important as you look at those specs, for example, that we understand that the 2000 series, this is not Ryzen 2, um, which right. I think we talked about last week as well. It's Ryzen 2000 which is the second generation of Ryzen, but it's essentially based on the same architecture. That's why Mm -hmm. you see Zen Plus there rather than Zen 2. So it does go from 14 nanometer to 12. Uh, You still have eight cores and 16 threads on the flagship parts. Cache is still the same. You get a slight DDR memory speed increase. Uh, The prices are competitive. Go ahead. it's, It's an evolution, not a revolution. Right, right. It's, it is, it is a... You know, they've tweaked latencies in L1 cache, L2 cache, L3 cache, DDR memory, which by their own metrics come up to about a 3% IPC improvement clock for clock, right? Okay. Which is modest. But you also take that into account if you look at the specs that the 2700X runs 200 to 300 megahertz faster than the mm-hmm. 1800X at, you know, similar, you know, base boost clock speeds, Right. So uh, you are getting a jump in frequency along with that. You are paying a little bit more on the TDP side. It's 105 watts versus 95 watts. Uh, but in the grand scheme of things for enthusiasts, DIY gamers, that that amount of difference isn't going to really isn't really going to change anything. Um, the the latency improvements that they did are kind of an interesting discussion. Um, they AMD was not interested in talking about how they were able to do this, right? I said, okay, right. how do you how do you make these impressive numbers without 
changing the architecture in some kind of fundamental way. And they kind of said, eh, you know, we're not really talking about it. These are just the numbers. And if you look at that, if you look at the graph down there, uh, the next graph that we put up there, we did our own kind of like ping testing, which tests communication time between all these threads, which essentially allows you to test the memory subsystems uh, of these processors. And there's a lot of lines there. What what I will say is, remember that the the Zen architecture, these parts are built into, they're designed with CCXs, core complexes. And each core complex has four cores and a block of L3 cache. And then mm -hmm. they communicate to the other CCX through Infinity Fabric, right? So another four cores and another block of L3 cache. And what you'll see there is that the gray line to the uh, uh, green and yellow line on the left-hand side there, where the gray line is lower, it's actually the 1800X has better latencies inside the CCX. So think of those really? four cores talking to each other. Talking to each right. other. If you look on the right-hand side, where that core is now talking to, across the CCX, you'll see that the gray bar is higher, meaning that the new processors have better latency. They've improved the L3 latency, uh, or uh, yeah, the 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 core to, the complex to complex latency pretty dramatically. Um, which is interesting. So you, you're basically, you're gaining 10 nanoseconds there and you're losing five nanoseconds on the bottom side. Now, clearly what it appears like to me is that they had to do a trade-off, that the tweaks they had to make to get these improvements in the architecture were at the expense of you know some other portion. And by their determination, they said, okay, actually getting that 10 nanoseconds is more valuable than losing this five nanoseconds. It could be mm -hmm. that maybe there's some threshold at 60 nanoseconds that as long as they're below that, they're safe or whatever it happens to be. I don't don't know. And again, they nobody would explain it to me. So I'm just kind of guessing here based on our data. Um, so that that's kind of like the architectural change, but the net result is that performance goes up. Uh, and so it's, it's hard to argue with that. They also launched the X470 chipset with this, which to be quite frank, doesn't really have advantages, significant advantages over the X370. Um, X470 motherboards will give you the capability to run Store MI, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, they will have slightly beefier power delivery systems integrated on them. And it also, uh -huh. these just have a year of learning that, you know, Asus, MSI, Gigabyte have done, uh, you know, after they developed the first Ryzen platforms, now they've they have had a year of education on what it is, user feedback, customer feedback, implementing it into new designs. So that's just what I would look at it, look at it for that. Because remember, these Ryzen 2000 series parts are backwards compatible to the X370 platform. As long as you've got the BIOS update for it, you'll be able to run those sure. in there, um, which is which is a plus. Uh, also, a big plus, actually, which I, we don't would normally say, is stock coolers. All of these new Ryzen 2000 series come with a stock cooler. And the 2700X, the flagship part, comes with something the, they're calling the Wraith Prism, which is that guy mm -hmm. right there. It's Prism because it's got LEDs in it, of course. But it's a it's a pretty yeah it's a pretty beefy heatsink. It's got you know six heat pipes. Uh, I think it's six. Yeah, six heat pipes, direct contact uh, to to the CPU heat spreader. Um, it's very robust for a stock cooler. It is. You know I mean? It's, like it's we, quiet. We're used right. to seeing like, yeah, no, I mean, you can see that the different sort of the, 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 the AMD cooler on the right there is kind of your standard, you know, we've seen it in so many Intel products and the AMD products, you know, it's a chunk of copper wrapped with aluminum, there's a fan, it's loud, it's miserable, but to actually see heat pipes and in sort of a more sophisticated uh, arrangement from a manufacturer is, is delightful and shocking. Um, yeah. <laughs> It's it's you know we we compared it to a, a 240 millimeter air uh, water cooler and it did you know it wasn't as good but it was pretty pretty close. Uh, it's quiet, it's easy to install, and it's included in the box, right? So that 329 dollar MSRP includes that cooler. So you know the 8700K, for example, from from Intel does not include a cooler. Right. So you have to buy at least a you know a thirty dollar cooler upwards of a fifty dollar cooler depending on what you're looking for. Um, in this case, you don't have to do that. There'll still be plenty of people that will do that. Um, but I think AMD made the right decision and kind of okay, we had some issues getting AM4 compatible coolers out into the market for these higher end flagship parts like the eighteen hundred X. Boom! Now we've solved it uh, and offered some value uh, to the consumer along the way. So it's it was it's a pretty impressive, pretty impressive shift. Um, in terms of performance, here's what here's what I will mm -hmm. kind of summarize the performance. And you can let me know if you have any other feedback on it. Is in single threaded performance, the 2700X 
closes the gap, but the but the Intel part is still faster. If we're we're kind of just looking at the 2700X and the 8700K, these are the two you know most important parts in this discussion. And if you look at uh, single threaded results, Cinebench or Audacity, which is an interesting interesting uh, decision or comment, um, you'll find that. You know, Intel still has the advantage there. That didn't go away. Yes, you might get uh, two or three hundred megahertz of extra clock speed, but it, it's not closing the gap completely. Uh, and right. multi-threaded workloads, AMD extends its lead, where it had eight-core, sixteen-thread going against uh, six-core, twelve-thread of the 8600K. That is still the case, and uh, uh, the the AMD parts are still faster. Like if you're looking at your Cinebench multi-threaded scores sure. right there. Um, Gaming was the sore spot for the Ryzen 1000 series launch, if you remember, 1080p gaming specifically. And in this instance, again, they closed the gap. It's not gone. The 8700K in the purest sense of the word is still the fastest part for this, you know, 1080p gaming scenario in our testing. Mm -hmm. uh, but the differences are a lot smaller. And you can see, you can compare the 2700X to the 1800X and see um, there are many places where it made some substantial improvements, right? Grand Theft Auto V, for example, uh, Assassin's Creed Origins, there were improvements, even in uh, Total War Warhammer 2. There's a lot of jumps that occur. And I think, you know, I think we tested eight or nine games, um, one or two of them, AMD is actually winning. The rest of them, Intel's winning, but by smaller margins. And obviously we even have, we do have 1440p and 4K testing that show you that as you increase the resolution that you're gaming at, the differences provided by the different processors is obviously uh, much more minimal. Um, you know, so if you're, if you're gaming on an ultra wide, if you're gaming on a 25 by 14 display, the, the processor choice has significantly lower impact on uh, on what your total total result is going to be. And oh, go ahead. I was going to say, so I'm not rushing out at this point to replace my beloved Ryzen 1800X. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, and, and I don't think really AMD intends that to be the case. What I do find interesting is because I've I've had this discussion with somebody about like what is the value of uh, being able to have a socket compatible processor from gen to gen? Because chances are the guy like you who bought an 1800X isn't going to go buy uh, a. a a 2700X to replace it with. You're getting a very right. marginal performance improvement. However, say you bought um, a, a Ryzen 5 1600, right? It's a six core part. Now you can upgrade to the eight core part. It's pen compatible. You're getting extra frequency. You're getting a little bit extra capability. Uh, and you can do that without having to replace your motherboard. Maybe you had a Ryzen 5 1400. Uh, maybe that was a Ryzen 3. I don't know. One of those uh, quad core parts, right? You can now double your core count on the same platform and mm -hmm. and you're good to go right so there there are still some advantages there no this is not a if you had a 1700 if you had an 1800 this is you probably don't want to go this way unless you just want the latest best neatest thing um right but the ability the flex having the flexibility to do that without needing to replace your motherboard certainly is a, a welcome change to what we've been used to over the past um many days I guess many years, <laughs> I would say, not just days. And and at three hundred twenty nine dollars, it's interesting. That's the price of the twenty seven hundred X. That's the new mm -hmm. flagship, current flagship for the Ryzen two thousand series. Remember that the eighteen hundred X launched at four ninety nine. So this is a hundred and seventy dollar price drop in terms of new to new, uh, and you're getting better performance because of it. Um, it's it's uh it's it's pretty impressive when you when you when you look at it that way right so um i i i came away pretty impressed more more than i thought it was going to be i don't think that it doesn't win everything right it's not winning all these gaming benchmarks they didn't suddenly flip right. the tables around on them there uh but in the areas where they excelled they increased that lead right so now the question will be, we'll talk about it later in the show, is Intel going to have to respond and release an eight-core part on their own or, you know, what? I don't, I don't know. It'll be interesting. <laughs> and also, I would point out from Ken, who, from Ken's review, he, he makes, if you look at the, the awards, the 2600X is the one that got the, uh, the editor's choice and the 2700X got the gold award, editor's choice being a, a, higher, a higher honor, I guess I would say. Because it is, it's, it's 100 bucks less than that, you still get an integrated cooler, um, which is high quality. It's not the Wraith Prism, but it's a it's a good cooler. It's a hundred bucks less, six core, twelve thread, and 
comparing it to the 8600K from Intel, it was a dominant winner, right? Because the 8600K is six cores, six threads, as opposed to this being six cores, 12 threads. Um, and so it wins on, I think, in almost all of the games and in all of the other benchmarks as well by a significant margin. So if uh, you don't want to buy the highest in part, um, you can still pick up the 2600X for 229 with, you know, maybe an integrated value of a 30 or $40 cooler in it. You're paying 199 bucks essentially for this part. It's going up against the 8600K. Um, so both, both of these solutions are really good. We also, we do have the 2700 and 2600. We'll probably do a follow-up at some point with those, although they're, you know, less interesting because of their, you know, lack of, of or no, lack of XFR and stuff like that. But they're going to be essentially in the same ballpark of performance. When you say a significant performance delta, I mean, are we talking single digits, double digits? Um, um you mean for the twenty six hundred X? In terms of the gaming performance, you mentioned. Yeah. Oh, in terms of the gaming performance, um, for the twenty seven hundred X, it's probably. 5% is where I would average it out. If we're looking at, you know, 5% behind the 8700K, if we're looking at the 2600X versus the Intel 8600K, now you're looking at even in the 1080p scores where, you know, it wins in ashes, it's uh, essentially tied in Ghost Recon, it's um, almost tied in GTA, which is one of, the, one of the worst cases for it. But it wins, I would say, half to a, more than half yeah, about half of the benchmarks in the gaming side at 1080p. Mm -hmm. uh, and then again, when you go to 25 by 14 or 4K, it doesn't even matter again. So depending on what you're going to pair it with on in terms of graphics card and display, um, it's even even more of a, uh, an, an easy decision, I guess I would say, in that regard. So there you have it. Yeah. So much excitement. I'm, I, I will say I'm pleased that I am not now weeping with a desperate need to save, you know, to move to a new processor to save additional time in rendering. Because that, that rendering delta between the, the 1800X and, and uh, the 2700X was, you know, 27 seconds on a 330-second render. Yeah. I can live with that. So <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was afraid I was going to read that review and be like, no, I must buy another processor. I can blood understand. Bank. That is self blood, um, <laughs> but it is. But again, I would say as I, I'm going to scroll through here and look, like if you had a Ryzen 5 1400, mm -hmm. which is a four core eight thread, still a good processor. That handbrake encoding was 738 seconds, and with this new processor, it drops to 306. Right, so now you're talking about actually an impressive upgrade path without having to replace right. your memory, without having to replace your motherboard. Drop in, you know, the cooler you're using before is probably going to be good enough as long as you bought a kind of a standard kind of DIY consumer class part. Um, pretty nice. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by On Deck. On Deck, 100% committed to small business owners with fast, easy, and tailored financing. Your time is valuable. Get funding in as fast as 24 hours with term loans up to a half million dollars and lines of credit up to $100,000, none of which require business collateral. The application process is simple. You can apply online or by phone and get approved in minutes, and it won't impact your personal credit. OnDeck delivers some of the best customer service with their U.S.-based loan specialist and has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. That's a good thing to see, people. They've lent over $10 billion to over 80,000 small business owners, and they carry a 9.8 out of 10 rating on Trustpilot. OnDeck is the secure financing service business owners everywhere can truly rely on. Their simple and secure web platform and mobile app, they make it easy to access your account anywhere, anytime. If you're a small business owner and need access to capital, go to ondeck.com slash twitch right now. And as a listener of This Week in Computer Hardware, you'll receive a free consultation with one of their U.S.-based loan specialists. Apply online or by phone and get approved in minutes. Go to ondeck.com slash twitch. That's O-N-D-E-C-K dot com slash T-W-I-C-H for your free consultation now. That's ondeck.com slash Twitch, and we want to thank On Deck for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Thanks. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, uh, except for those people who had NDAs signed and uh, special relationships with Samsung, we find the Samsung 970 Pro 512 gigabyte 970 Evo 250 500 gigabyte and 1 terabyte NVMe review. So, yep. What's the word, man? 
Uh, so the word is, uh, generally speaking, uh, it is about like a 5 to 10% increase in all of the things over the equivalent 960s, basically. Nice. Um, that's probably the simplest way to put it. It's very much an incremental style upgrade. There are some changes, like with the 960 series. If you might remember, the Pro, Samsung did some trick where they put the DRAM into the, the package of the controller to make more room for more flash packages. And then you had this sort of backwards thing where the Pro model was available in higher capacities than the Evo, even though TLC can store more bits for a given space than MLC. Um, that's no longer the case here. Uh, they've just gone back to like basics. Uh, these are all the same kind of PCB layout. They all have mm -hmm. external DRAM, which is going to make it you know, cheaper for Samsung to produce. Whether or not that results in a lower cost price is up for debate, as we'll discuss is probably towards the tail end of this part of this discussion. But, um, uh, you know, it's kind of a simpler thing. They upped um, other differences. They upped the Evo to a five-year warranty. Evo has historically been three-year warranty. Um, so now they both have the same warranty period. Uh, <laughs> it's really down to how much do you want better performance because the pro still offers better performance, even though the Evo is still pretty darn good performance. Um, I mean, we're, are we talking you, about 10% difference? Are we talking about 25% difference? Are we talking about, you know, single digits in performance? So if you go to the, uh, if you go to the client Q depth weighted page of my review and the first chart, you will see that the, let's compare say a one terabyte 970 Evo, which is the third entry in that chart. Uh, the blue line is important here. This is your read. Like, what you're basically going to... This this number translates to, like, the feel of the SSD in a system. Mm -hmm. So 970 Evo comes in at around 22,000. So that's, like, your equivalent IOPS that you would see running kind of normal stuff in a system at normal Q depths. So 22,000 goes up 27.6 with a 970 Pro. Um, so that's more than single-digit changes. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's definitely a difference. Whether or not that's a difference that you will actually feel trying to use the system will depend on how current that system is. Because when you mm -hmm. start pushing IOs as high as these things do, you start running into, if you're running a typical game or a typical, you know, application workload, you, you kind of shift the bottleneck around, right? As you speed up the storage mm -hmm. device. Now the bottleneck shifts off to the CPU, trying to actually do stuff with that information, right. et cetera. So, you know, if you're on modern, current kind of bleeding edge hardware, you're probably going to care about that difference between an Evo <laughs> or a Pro. Um, you know, if you if you really are of that mentality that I have to have the newest, fastest everything. For the rest of us, myself included, even even though I'm kind of a storage nut, I would be perfectly happy with Evo level performance. Um, one one way to uh, point that out. A little bit better and put it into a little bit better context regarding these particular products is if you look at the uh, mixed or mixed burst results, which is where the system is actually trying to do something in the background mm -hmm. while trying to do reads. Um, we'll just skip like right to the uh, go down more, more, more. Go to the read service time chart. It's like the second blue chart. Uh, so this is how long did it take to do a bunch of things that totaled up to four gigabytes worth of reads? on you know with these different products right and uh you'll notice that you know 970 evo it's like four, almost five seconds 4.7 seconds you go to a 960 pro uh that was four seconds which was you know again faster but the 970 pro drops that to 3.7 seconds look at the kind of hairs you're splitting here right you're you're now down to a 0.3 second delta from the previous generation pro to the current one you know out of out of four seconds, 0.3 out of four. Um, and if you scroll way down <laughs> past that next crazy long chart to the crazy long chart after it, it's longer than the VJ might realize it is because it's every SSD we've tested. Mm -hmm. It's pretty long. Okay, there you go. Um, so 3.7 seconds was the 970 Pro. If you go all the way up to the bleeding edge, like 900p Optane SSD from Intel, that only gets you down to 3.4. So that's only another point three. Basically, you're 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 getting into the whole diminishing returns thing here, right. right? Yes, the thing. Yes, they're going faster, but how much faster can they possibly go to the point where 
other things are limiting you, right? Um, and and that's kind of where we are here, at least as far as <laughs> our test suite and our results uh, come up with compared to you know the landscape of products that are out there. So yes, it's faster. Yes, it's actually halfway to an Optane drive as far as the time it takes the new model to do stuff over the old model for the pros. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you're you're splitting hairs compared to you know is your I don't know if your time is so valuable that you're measuring it in tenths of a second to do four gig worth of activity on a system. I mean, I'm I'm so. sure there's you know there's there's probably people that are dealing with like Wall Street trading systems or you know super oh yeah high. those guys those guys are doing all their stuff in RAM. That's true. Like they. They're not even, this is not even in the same kind of ballpark as, as, as those folks. When latency is super mm -hmm. critical like that, they shift completely. Like they're using Optane stuff and they're using RAM, right? Um, but, you know, these drives are for, it's not even an enterprise drive here. This is a consumer drive. It's just meant for, you know, you and me to put in our, in our systems and use, <laughs> right? Um, so... Here's uh, kind of the thing where I wish Samsung would have done better given the more simplistic design as the pricing mm -hmm. towards the end of my article. Uh, the pros are coming in at a little bit over 60 cents a gig and the Evos Whoa. are still running around 45 cents a gig, which is, mm -hmm. I know you say, whoa, but that's roughly where the previous generation was sitting. I know, um, but given that some of the drives you've seen, the, especially in the last couple of weeks, that's just so I agree expensive. with you. Um, <laughs> I agree with you. Samsung is still able to get away with this because, I mean, they have a pretty, they've been in this thing for a long time. Their drives are very proven, you know, now, and they're still the, the fastest game in town, right? right. So if you, absolutely, if you absolutely need the fastest, that, that's the price you have to pay. Yes, you're right, Patrick. There is totally the Western Digital and SanDisk offering we just reviewed last week. And that thing... Is a very impressive drive, and it actually beat the 960 Evo in a couple of our tests. Um, <laughs> and it's a way cheaper drive. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and if you're worried about the cost, go with that. If you're worried about the performance and you absolutely want the fastest thing, Samsung is, again, the only game in town now that they've released these 970s. Go, go, gadget, Oculus, go. The Cord Cutters VR headset. Um, I was... You know, I I am torn between being really excited because there's a, there's another VR headset release coming in the in the near future that I can't really talk about. But the uh, I thought this was interesting. They're, you're looking at uh, the uh, the intern at the Verge offices as they were trying to figure out how to do battery testing on this. But we're looking at this is a self-contained Snapdragon. I want to say 821 powered. Uh, yep. You know, VR display. Uh, think uh, 2016 flagship phone in terms of the specs, except obviously with a radically different screen experience. Um, I I gotta say my I my big disappointment at that is essentially this is a much better daydream experience um, than cardboard or or strapping your phone sure. into a daydream. Uh, it's a huge improvement, but you don't have access to the Oculus games, which makes it kind of fall apart for me. Is that a, is that well, a, you don't, you, know, you don't have Oculus to the, you don't have access to the Oculus PC games necessarily. Right. right? Um, but you do have access to the Oculus store, uh, which, which essentially has anything that Google daydream would have plus a little right. bit extra. Right. Um, I mean, it's a nice headset I, by all accounts. It's comfortable. It's a nice headset. The, the hardware is not what you would find in a modern smartphone, but there's a couple of things that they do right. One is it's really cheap, right? This is 199 mm -hmm. bucks for the 32 gig model, 249 for the 64 gig model, which is, you know, how much was a Gear VR when they're new? 100 bucks, 150 bucks, mm -hmm. and that was for just the shell. But then you had to buy a 600 to 800 dollar right. phone to put in it. So in terms of like lowering total cost for cell phone class VR right. this is doing an excellent job of doing that also um speakers this has a different kind in. of screen in it what's that yeah it, well it does have speakers built in you, um, you, you should, kind I'm of sorry like on the edge you should talk about you should talk about the you should talk about the screen because that's much more important than my obsession with this with the speaker implementation <laughs> on that <laughs> okay i will also i will back you up on the speaker implementation shortly um but the the screen is interesting in that it is 
it's an LCD screen. It's not an OLED screen. And it so the downside to that is that the the blacks aren't as deep, they aren't as dark. The contrast ratio isn't as wide as you would see like on a on a Galaxy S9 that's put into um, a a Gear a VR Galaxy or something S9 like that. Costs four times as much. Correct, correct. But I'm I have, I'm here to tell you that the I actually prefer the screen on this than I have with any other slot in VR system. It is the screen door effect on this is incredibly minimal. This is these are 2560 by 1440 per eye displays, right? Um, but this because of the because of kind of the reduction in contrast, the screen door effect is almost gone. You can read text in this thing. Um, I, I watched uh, I did the Plex VR deal where I watched two episodes of a TV show while sitting on my couch in front of my big TV. So it didn't make a whole lot of sense, but uh, <laughs> just for, for testing it out. Um, and it was really pretty positive. Like I didn't feel like my eyes were getting strained or that I worried about uh, any any of those ill effects of, uh, of poor screen implementation. Uh, so I came away, and, and even though it's a 72 hertz peak refresh screen, mm -hmm. it apparently either operates at 60 hertz or 72, not in anything in between. So it's less than the 90 that we've seen on other VR headsets. So that could be concerning. In the again, in the in the things that I have done and watched, it hasn't really been that big of a problem. Um, I haven't played a whole lot of games yet, but I. Went did some like 3D experiences stuff, like, like a Star Wars thing where you're in a 360 environment and you can wander around, or not really wander around, but look around. Um, it's I think the screen is really impressive. It's got fairly low persistence for an LCD, even compared to OLEDs. Um, so that that's a positive. The you mentioned the speakers. Mm -hmm. The so it sounds stupid. <laughs> that it would be that we would be that impressed with there being speakers on this because there is a headphone jack which is good you want that in case you you know you're trying to be actually totally immersed or you don't want to bother people around you but they've implemented speakers kind of on the edges of the device here you know left and a right and as a result you don't have to put on headphones to use this if you're not doing anything that would require it, right? If you're just watching a video, if you're um, uh, interacting with a game and that's already in kind of a quiet environment, it actually works really well. And I preferred it at my house because I wasn't completely cut off from the outside world. If somebody was walking around behind me or whatever in front of me, I could hear them. I had the TV right. on because there was an NBA basketball game. And you know, while I was interacting and messing with stuff and testing it, I could listen for what the score was, whatever, if I wanted to take off the headset and watch that instead. Um, so I, I, I think it's a novel addition that actually makes it a, a significantly more useful product as a quick hit device. You know, Put it on for 20 mm -hmm. minutes, take it off. You know, as opposed to, oh, where's where are my headphones? Oh, I've got the lightning ones with me, but these don't work on this. Now I got to find the adapter or whatever it would be. Sure. Um, although you still have that option if you want to use it on like a noisy plane or something like that, or you're trying to block out your family, whatever. You know, there's a headphone jack. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The speakers don't get exceptionally loud, I will say, mm -hmm. at max volume, but. You know, again, uh, it does come with a kind of a controller, like a three off, three degrees of freedom um, controller, just like Daydream does. Right. Same thing as the headset. It is three off, so that essentially means that it can uh, measure movement in three dimensions, but not in six. The six off is the other kind of big one. That's like if you take a step forward or backward, does it track that? And this device doesn't do that. And I will say having, it's been a while since I've used a VR system that wasn't externally tracked or had six off capability. So the fact that when I was in that, uh, uh, like this, the Star Wars kind of VR experience mm -hmm. that I downloaded, when I leaned forward a little bit, purposefully leaned forward a little bit and the, and the, the environment doesn't you know, negotiate that. It doesn't indicate that I've done that. It is still off-putting, right? And it's still kind of right. like, mm, okay, I could see how people might not like this. They recommend you sit down when you use this that because that will greatly prevent those types of things from happening, right. from you leaning forward, stepping forward, et cetera. And there's also no capability. There's no... um uh, like, uh, what do you call it? The system where it shows grids around the area, right? So you don't mm -hmm. walk into something or run into something. None of that exists. Well, so, which, I mean... We should point out, so for those of you who are not particularly familiar with, with VR vernacular, three degrees of freedom essentially means forward and back, up and down, and then left and right. And then 
when you get into pitch, yaw, and roll, that's the six degrees of freedom. I mean, what happens when you when you when you sort of like you know look up like this or like that or is, you know can, what can you can you look you know can you comfortably look around like this inside of there yeah. or to think, okay yeah but yeah, when you don't have you to be move, you don't have to be like, perfectly rigid you don't have to mm -hmm. be perfectly rigid but it's like if you you know you look down that's fine if I look down and then want to lean down or crouch down to touch something it doesn't know that right it, it's it's right. it's not capable of measuring that so and in many ways that's how all of the slot in phone versions of VR have worked since the beginning uh, and this is still a push for that so it's not a revolutionary thing but again for $199 you can buy them at Best Buy it it does some things it's it's like i said i wore it for about an hour and 45 minutes straight which is more than i've worn a vr headset in a long time and i didn't uh -huh. i was i didn't have any discomfort either from eye fatigue or nausea or like it just fitting poorly um they it, it all seems to work pretty well do i think that this changes the landscape of vr immediately probably not but mm -hmm. it it's it's the right move, you know. Um, I, I think these untethered headsets still have the most potential. Um, you're going to have a very different experience, obviously, because you're gaming right. on a Snapdragon 821 device as opposed to a GTX 1080 Ti. So keep that in mind. But um, so far, I like it, you know. And I went out to Best Buy whenever they launched, what Tuesday, I guess it was mm -hmm. Monday, Tuesday, and and picked it up. It is built by Xiaomi, which is kind of interesting. Um, but uh, it's 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 a neat product. It it it's it's better than I expected it to be for one ninety nine. I I thought we were gonna see the the beginning of the end of VR and you know kind right. of this this pessimistic view. But the image quality is good. The little accents, like adding speakers to it, is really good. Comfort is good. Um, yeah, I've been I've been impressed. And it's, I mean, we should point out, you know, when you've been talking about a a, a VR experience, you know for most of the last couple of years, it's either been an expensive desktop PC and an expensive piece of hardware. And then of course the hardware dropped down to like $400 in the case of the, the Oculus Rift. And then the price finally came down on the Vive. Uh, and that you have a physical cable tethering you to that desktop um, right. or you were doing the, the smartphone stuff, which is really kind of a fascinating taster, but I think more often than not was fairly frustrating in terms of the experience, especially in the cases where you were like, I'm going to tap on the side of this plastic thing I've strapped to my face because that's the only way I can control it um, yeah. to, you know, you've got like the Oculus Go, I want to say the, the Mirage Solo uh, uh, Lenovo's Mirage Solo with Daydream, which has the World Sense technology, so you can lean and duck and move uh, inside of things. Um, mm -hmm. That's gonna, you know, the, the, those are pre-ordered for like four hundred dollars. <laughs> one thing I want to ask you, because I'm I'm circling picking up one of the Oculus Goes to to do a review of it. Thirty-two gigs or sixty-four gigs? Because by nature, I always want to get more memory, but yeah, you know, do do the apps for that take up much space? Um, I. I would say yes, right? So one of the other demos, I so you download this Disney demo and it has a bunch of options in Marvel or Disney or Star Wars, like little experiences you can do. Some of them are interactive, most of them are not. And they give you the option of streaming or downloading, right? And it's, the streaming is, you know, lower resolution. You might get some frame stutters, which is obviously a bad idea in VR. So mm -hmm. I was always downloading everything. And each of these was about a gig to two gigs a piece. Uh, I downloaded a Jurassic World thing, which was uh, a small experience where you followed around a Velociraptor as it kind of interacted with some other dinosaurs. And uh, the download was, wasn't was working on it, but it was like a three gig, four gig download. So I, I do think probably the higher capacity is better because remember you're getting 32 gigs minus whatever the operating system is. I haven't figured out a way to look into it and see uh, exactly what that is. I will note that uh, for example, that the, I did tried to do the streaming of the Jurassic world mm -hmm. event thing. Um, and they must have been having some, some capacity issues because it was, it was hard stuttering quite a bit. It was um, unnerving for me to look at this dinosaur up close and having suddenly have the dinosaur itself start macro blocking because the, you know the, the bandwidth was low and then it would kind of go more into focus and then out of focus. It was very uh, it took you out of the experience pretty dramatically. So 
I would count on downloading everything. So you're going to use a lot of space. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I can't say for sure. I, my guess is that you would just for 50 bucks buy the 64 gig model. Um, you know, 50 bucks for 32 gigs of storage is kind of a bad deal, I guess. But if you separate right. them by anything less than that, nobody would buy the smaller one. And I think they desperately <laughs> wanted to get to that 199 price tag. So interesting. It's been a messy couple of years for Intel, to say the least. Uh, and that's not even getting into Melter, uh, Meltdown and Spectre, not Melter, although Melter does sound kind of good. Um, and, you know, then there was the issues with, you know, Brian Kurzanich. Uh, you could say there's been some leadership issues, some direction issues, um, some issues maybe formulating a long-term plan to, to fight off the, the threat, if you will, uh, of ARM processing. Sure, he dumped $39 million in stock before the, the, the massive meltdown and specter flaws were publicly known. But that wasn't insider trading, just a coincidence. Uh, so he's finally resigned, of all things, uh, over a relationship with an employee, which is against the rules at Intel. I, I got to ask fraternization. Which, on one level, I get, because uh, one of the first large media companies I worked at was very unusual uh, in that they actually had a whole, there was a news, this was back when they still did like newsletters. There was a whole section of the newsletter that was about people who had gotten engaged or married who all worked at the company, which was, I thought, really surreal. Um, you know, and I, I get non fraternization policies. Don't date where you work. Uh, there's another earthier version of that phrase you may be thinking of right now as a listener. Yes. Uh, this just seems like this was... You know, this was this is not a case of nobody's claiming that this was harassment. Nobody's claiming that this was unwanted. It was consensual. Both parties were down with it. It was just against the rules, and it's become known. And now Krasanich is resigned. Does this does this reek of a convenient way to have him exit stage right while they look for new leadership? Well, you know, I guess two things on that. One, uh, usually a lot of sometimes this fraternization thing can be overlooked because, hey, this person is in a different section. And they don't report mm -hmm. to anybody else and there's no, you know, superiority, inferior uh, type relationship. But everybody right. is inferior to Brian. And so, uh, <laughs> yes, that would be very inappropriate. And two, yeah, it's um, – it is very convenient because if you've looked at Intel in the past 40 years, mm -hmm. um, when they've had strong competition, their business has done great because they've always risen to meet the challenge. Mm -hmm. And if you look when the competition, such as like when the original Athlon was, was introduced, the Athlon 64, which Intel simply didn't have an answer for, they took that those those changes too hard. The competition – and they made tremendous products and, and and jumps afterwards. I mean, the Pentium 3 was was a really good product, especially when they went to copper mine. Um, you know, the Pentium 4 was was pretty crappy. But the the Core 2 Duo and the Conroe stuff, I mean, it just it just placed Intel so far ahead of everybody else. Then AMD had lots of stumbles. But we have not seen huge jumps in performance. Um core counts, anything, since they introduced the original i7-920 uh, and 940 and, and that generation of stuff. That was the, the the basic model. You had, at the top end, four cores, eight threads. Mm -hmm. And they have milked that and milked that and milked that. And sure, there have been some pretty decent iterations of products where we've seen a consistent increase in IPC, uh, better power characteristics, you know, better clocking throughout time. But We've kind of been stuck in the same place for a while. And a lot of that is, I, I, I think it is, it is basically leadership. You don't have the vision. You're, you're enjoying the margins that you have without increasing your R&D when you think that, hey, you know, maybe things won't be going right in the future. Let's make sure and, and utilize some of this money we've we've been making and and make sure we continue to be ahead of the competition. And instead, it, it seems like in between the bean counters and them just kind of saying, you know, AMD is is one sixteenth our size. There's no way that they could produce anything that is going to cause any issues for us or that we can't match in rather quick order. But now we've got this perfect storm of 
Ryzen is a really good design. AMD is mm -hmm. leveraging uh, Samsung and Global Foundries and TSMC to not only have solid products right now, but in the next year, in 2019, it's going to be even better because they will be utilizing a seven nanometer product, probably from TSMC first. They may leverage Global Foundries later on. Um, Samsung doesn't sound like they'll be doing that, but uh, seven nanometer TSMC on paper looks very, very similar to what Intel attempted to do with their 10 nanometer process. But when you throw in the other factors about what Intel threw into their 10 nanometer process, it, it really does seem to me it was a bridge too far. They just, and I mean, it's obvious now because it's not working as it should. It's not yielding as it should. The products that are coming off of it are not that impressive. And mm -hmm. uh, they're they're hurting. I mean, 2018 is is good for them. I mean, they've reused the 14 nanometer process. They've they've uh, added to it. It's it's you know an iterative process. They're now what on 14 nanometer plus plus, and um, their margins are still great because they have a competitive product for 2018. We don't know what 2019 is going to bring at all. <laughs> so yes, yeah. I, I think the the in between manufacturing, uh, leadership and vision and you know I, you you can't argue that Intel is not doing well because they're right. doing extremely well. They have record after record quarter, and they're still going to do great throughout this year. They're going to do very good next year, even with these challenges. And and I mean they have done okay in widening their product base. They've they've kind of gotten out of mobile because. They just didn't put the focus on competing with ARM that they probably should have. And now they, they I don't know, they just feel like it's an area that is no longer viable, but it's such a huge market. And so maybe the board of directors is looking at this as like, you know, we don't like where we're going. Sure, things are good now, but looking down the lane, it's, it's looking grim. And so yes, having this come up is very convenient for the board and the shareholders, because you're not firing this guy for his performance. Right. And the things you're seeing down the road, it's because he had this consensual relationship while he's married and with another person at Intel. It is something they could, you know, get him to resign and say that. And yeah. if you notice <laughs> their announcement, what was the second part of their announcement? Uh, well, the first part was... Um, that the resignation was accepted to show that, quote, all employees will respect Intel's values and adhere to the company's code of conduct, dot, 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 and that the board of directors has, quote, a robust succession planning process in place and has begun a search for a permanent CEO, including both internal and external candidates. And uh, then at the bottom of that, the forward-looking <laughs> statements. Oh, by the way, our next quarter is going to be even stronger than even we thought. Right. <clears throat> Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Special correspondent from Petaluma, California. <laughs> Young Leo Laporte from Petaluma, California. Leo, can you hear me? As long as I can have my champers and not worry about the keyboard, I'm happy. Hello, uh, Patrick. Hello, Ryan. I have actually, I'm not going to horn in on your show, but I, Patrick, you're going to be on the new screensavers this week. True. And I have a modest proposal for you, and I want to oh. run it. <laughs> I want to run I'm it by you. Not eating any babies, Leo. <laughs> Let's get that out there right now. I do have to say that this is this is, by the way, the new uh, 2018 MacBook Pro, and uh, I I am the, I've never been a fan of that keyboard. I hate the Touch Bar too. I think a lot no. of people know that. I do feel like this keyboard is subtly different, and it's you know I think the silicone seal, which is clearly there, also has the benefit of kind of giving you a little bit more uh, resilience when you tap. I just feel like there's such a short travel on these keys that it stubs your fingers almost. And it's hard for me to type accurately on this. I had a MacBook, I had the 13 inch. I've I've tried them all. This one seems marginally better. But really, the reason I'm here is to ask you about the i9. And I think you all saw Dave Lee, YouTuber Dave Lee's uh, review of the i9-based MacBook Pro, in which he said it was throttling. Uh, the, the i9 wasn't running at full speed because of heat. He used a couple of ways to demonstrate this. One was to recompile a Premiere project. 
Uh, and he showed how much slower it was as it got hotter. He put it in the freezer, and it performed much better. So uh, there's the freezer uh, video. Uh, the bottom bar is in the freezer. The, the top bar is not in the freezer. You can see shorter is better, the much better performance in the freezer. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and I know this has been a problem. I've seen this, uh, others complain about this in the i7 for years, even on those wonderful Lenovo ThinkPads. There are i9, uh, uh, I think Dell has an i9 uh, to XPS 15. There's some other ones. I don't know if they're experiencing throttling. But I thought we should test this on Saturday. Now, I'm waiting. I, I want to see what PC Perspective and non-tech, the, the re people who really know what they're doing. Not, Dave's good, but I want to see some real laboratory results before I say that this is an issue. <laughs> the, Dave said, and he's, he's, it's, he's got a good point, there's no obvious redesign of the cooling subsystem in here. Right. Even though you've got now six cores on the i9 running at 2.9 gigahertz and up. Uh, so there's a lot... But what somebody pointed out, and I think this is an interesting point, and I think, Ryan, you've already tipped to this, is that when you're doing that Premiere Pro uh, uh, rendering, it's using the CPU and the GPU, both are pegged, which, of course, is going to be the hottest possible scenario in this thing, right? Yeah. So there's a couple of things I'm going to try. One is One of the reasons I wanted this is for compiling software. That's very bursty. You know, if, if it compiles in 20 seconds, it's probably not going to see much throttling, and it may be a real benefit. But the other thing I want to try, this is the eGPU, which, interestingly, Apple announced at the same time. They don't make this. this Black Magic makes this. It has a somewhat, not a, it's not a top of the line. It's not a 1080 Ti Radeon, uh, NVIDIA in here. It's still a Radeon. What is it, a 580, I think it is? 580, yeah. yeah. So, but it's an eGPU. And Apple recently updated Mac OS to automatically support it. I noticed when I plugged it in over the Thunderbolt, the 40 gigabyte Thunderbolt 3 port, it immediately saw it on the MacBook Pro and started using it. In fact, believe it or not, I've just been doing updates and the MacBook Pro is hot and the eGPU is, is perceptively mm -hmm. warmer. But my theory is, and I think we can maybe test this, it's not a laboratory, but we can kind of get some sense of it. What if it is the fact that both the GPU and the CPU were pegged, causing a huge amount of thermals in here? What if you mm -hmm. use the eGPU? What if this is why Apple's pushing the eGPU to take some of that load off? So we're not going to do it with Premiere Pro. Uh, we're going to do it with Final Cut because presumably that's going to be optimized for Apple hardware. <laughs> that's a brazen assumption. Well, but I think it's <laughs> fair to say that. And, and certainly... Uh, you know, I don't know what Adobe's incentive is to optimize for Apple hardware. I haven't seen them optimize Photoshop or Lightroom for Apple hardware. So let's let's give Apple the benefit of the doubt and use Final Cut Pro 10. I think most people who buy this, this is a $4,000 laptop, are going to probably use Final Cut anyway, right? Um, so I will. I, I think I was. So what do you think of that? That's my modest proposal. That maybe it's a it's a GP and an eGPU might solve that if that's what you need to do. Um, it solves it as long as you're at home. Well, I admit it, it's not a portable solution You could take anymore. your $6,000. Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, this thing's heavy. It's really a docking station. It has all these extra <laughs> yeah. ports on the back, plus a GPU. And it's not, <laughs> and by the way, at 700 bucks. it's not upgradable. So that's not good. But it's, it's does, good does, for black magic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and only, it's exclusive to Apple, so it's good for Apple, too, because they take their cut at the Apple store. So together now, we're getting $5,000. This is $5,000 worth of hardware. Uh, you know... I, I, I mean, first of all, I guess my qu two questions: Are we seeing okay. i9? I know we've seen this in the past with i7, i9 heat throttling in other machines. It's not that many machines that run i9s. Yeah, uh, there's the Dell X15. Yeah, it's the only one I know of. And yeah. most of the time, they're Maybe using. ROG. They're also in larger, uh, yeah. more gaming centric machines. You look at machines, those gaming things. Which, they got giant tornado yeah. fans in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's because I, I the, think, the, look how thin this is, and the only vent is in the crack <laughs> yeah. between the screen and the body. I mean, this thing is not designed for yeah. heat dissipation, even if it's a, a I, unibody I aluminum, at, I look but that's at the, not. I look at his results very simplistically and pragmatically, right? Right. He rendered a video, which is something yeah. that a ton of people who buy MacBook Pros are going to do. do. Yeah. Um, regardless of what software they're using, video rendering is a terrific benchmark and use case for yeah. this. And it's kind of... Um, uh, it, it's impossible to me that Apple didn't 
do this testing with their device and come to the same conclusion immediately that, oh, as it turns out, it's slower than the other variant. Yeah, because it is a long extended workload. You use the term bursty to talk about some other workloads. Compiling can be, but if you have a larger compiling job, if you're in, in, mm -hmm. you know, encoding well, or, or the guy who wrote compiling Geekbench, Blender, for example, it's going to take a while. The guy who wrote Geekbench uh, didn't have an i9, but he did with the i7. He did 10 compiles of Geekbench and did yeah. not see throttling. So that was a half okay. an hour yeah. of nonstop compiling. Note, notebookcheck.net posted something today where they did successive runs of uh, Cinebench, which is a GPU rendering. No, I'm sorry. It's a CPU rendering app. And so it does not use the GPU. It's only using the CPU. And it had dramatic fall off right. after the first couple I'm uh, a little nervous about synthetic benchmarks. I would prefer to see things well, like the sure. Premiere Pro. So rendering. we were talking before the show. Uh, I had a friend of mine who who bought the maxed out Surface Book. It's like $3,300, um, you know, an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 925 or 965 uh, GPU, which is not that powerful, but certainly a big step up from the Intel graphics. 16 gigabytes of RAM, one terabyte SSD. And he's like, it's a dog. What do you mean it's a dog? You spent $3,300. He's like, it's a delete expletive dog. And I did something really simple. I just ran uh, my favorite way to torture uh, laptops, which is Handbrake and desktops, right? Um, Handbrake, a uh, friend of mine who, who, who works for a company that can spend anything they want on any rendering tool anywhere basically uses Handbrake. It's good enough for them. It's good enough for me. And, you know, I fired up this $3,300 machine. Uh, which had a you know top of the line like Core i7 CPU. It's got NVIDIA GeForce. Blah 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 blah. Uh, and it also basically has no fan. And it within literally probably the first 30 seconds of a 10 minute render. What 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 should have been a 10 minute render, you know, it throttled up and then it just slowed down. Yeah. And it was brutal because, you know, my like at this point, generation previous Core i5 with half as much RAM was running faster than a brand new state of the art $3,300 flagship machine from one of the largest tech companies in the world. Um, it's not just Apple doing this. Like, you know, sure. let's do thin, let's do inadequate cooling, let's do maybe cooling that's okay. Well, we can, we can dissipate 45 watts, you know, for this long. This, and it's, it's, go ahead. Uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say this is this is a this is a this is a trade off. This is a decision yeah. that manufacturers are making, as you're as you're pointing out, right? That the number of people that do long sustained work on their machine, rendering a video, uh, uh, compiling code, yeah. um, whatever it happens to be, is is small, and it's also a small portion of your time. Yeah, but and if not, it's not the a small portion of your time. These devices. That's exactly who buys these devices. Well, yeah, but, but I would. That's who they're aiming at. This is a you know, pro I've, device. I've, I have. I've, I'm. I, I've. I was. I was working at a place a few years ago where they bought brand new laptops for the executive team, um, while the editing team was still using two-year-old desktops. And I bring this up because in a lot of cases, there's a lot of people spending a lot of money on hardware, and they basically they run Excel spreadsheets. And they use the web, and they use Google Docs, and they use you know okay, but um, Slack Apple, or whatever. Apple but has it, a product line. They have a MacBook, which is an executive computer. This Apple is aiming at pros, and so regardless of what morons buy it, if <laughs> <laughs> we what we want to know is if the people who are going to buy it for those purposes, the purposes Apple's specifying, photographers, sure. developers, sure. music makers, and filmmakers, if this is inadequate then we need to know this. I, I would give generally give Apple the benefit of the doubt on this. Uh, you know, one thing we don't know, Dave Lee's computer, maybe he got a sample that didn't have the thermal paste, wasn't done right. It's possible. Sure. There's all sorts of possibilities. I want to see this same result across the board with a lot of different computers before yeah. I'm going to run to rush to judgment. And I know we'll do the an imperfect test, but I think we ought to do something like this on Saturday. On the Absolutely. Saturday savers, I, th I think that's see. a great idea. I think it's a yeah. great idea. And, and I think basically just duplicate what he's done and then add in this part where you add in the external GPU and see if it, what, what I think will happen, if I'm going to guess here, is that it will cut the difference between the two platforms, but it mm -hmm. won't uh, we'll fix it. won't kill it completely. Yeah. yeah. And what I was going to say before is the, yes, the professionals are buying these to do those renderings, but you're not rendering eight hours a day. You might be editing right. and right. working in Premiere, but that last, that final output cut 
render takes 35 minutes of your day type of thing. So well, does, um, it yeah, still, but, does it still make sense then to buy it for the other stuff you're doing? No. So that's really the question. Should I buy an i9? Should I buy an i7? Maybe I should just buy an i5 <laughs> because if I'm not going to get the full uh, yeah. performance out of the i9 or the i7, there's no point in spending more for it. Well, it's a it's a it's it's a real problem, right? Because you want the discrete graphics because that's going to accelerate a broad range of things that are going. Not everything, because uh, Adobe's code base continues to be weird. Um, and, well, but and, Intel's you know, hasn't updated their Iris Pro in how many years? Two years. Well, but it's years? it's just it, there. It'll it, you know it's going to be at least two years before there's anything from Intel you, you're going to slap in the general direction right. of, of Premiere or or the Creative Suite and and make much of a difference. Uh, the, the issue is is that like Ryan's right. Yeah, you may only spend 35 minutes a day rendering, you know. But if you're doing if you're doing a whole bunch of processing work, um, it is a big deal. If you think you're going to go like I last time I bought a new laptop and spent six thousand dollars, I cut twenty percent off my rendering time. What if your rendering time goes up because this thing is so thermally throttled? What that would if, be really bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I really mean, feel ripped off. <laughs> you know, I went. I, went should, in the, I would so, agree. It should never have gone up. Like if it right. worst case scenario for me should have been like, oh, this turned out to have the same render time as the last generation quad core, right? That right. means you've properly balanced the thermals with the clock speed uh, uh, tables that you have in place for this particular design, right? It, the, the fact that it goes down is kind of crazy. Yeah. In theory. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that there are other use cases for six cores that mm -hmm. do make sense. Most of the mm -hmm. most of the things we do, except for these high end uh, professional tools, are only using one core anyway. The higher clock speed of the i9 might be a benefit there. But there are other things you do. Maybe if I have, you know, I'm doing three different things at once, and each is using a separate core. I usually use something, and I did this on the iMac Pro, and I will compare this, by the way, to the uh, 10 core iMac Pro as well. Uh, I, I use something called iStat Pro, which is widely used among Mac people to give you a look at thermals mm -hmm. and CPU mm -hmm. uh, performance. And so we'll put that on here as well so we can kind of see. Yeah. I guess Intel has a tool as well. I don't, I, mean, I might put GeekBitch right here. I don't really like synthetic benchmarks all that much. <laughs> I don't know. Synth what do you think? I, I understand that. I understand that mentality, but synthetic benchmarks or so, so you, I mentioned Cinebench before. Cinebench is a benchmark, but Cinebench. It's actually like doing that, stuff. That Cinema 4D yeah. is a well-known yeah. right. and used rendering engine, right? So, yeah. uh, the the Cinebench part of it just lets us do it in a repeatable, you know, more scientific fashion. Right. You know, ironically, yeah. this laptop plus GPU is roughly the same cost as the base model iMac Pro. I think <laughs> Apple. No, I seriously think that Apple is looking at this new MacBook Pro as a reasonable mobile version of an iMac Pro. It doesn't have 10 or 32 cores, but it's it's I think you're right, Patrick. If you have to carry this around, you've defeated the entire purpose of it. This is a lot. Yeah. Of I mean, it's it's and, and it's it's frustrating because you you know, a lot of people aban you know, Apple stopped doing really good support for Final Cut a few years ago and then Adobe, I mean, Adobe and this is going back a few years, that there is one application that I know of in the history of Adobe and some of their applications are pretty long in the tooth at this point. There is one application where they went, you know what? It's a teardown. And they started over fresh. And that was Premiere. Because the original version of Premiere was such a hot mess. They could not, they, 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 they couldn't put a bag on the side of the box. They couldn't fix it in any way. And they re-architected it from the ground up. And they started talking to, you know, they basically went to people other than auteurs and and college film students and said, How do you use Final, you know, well, how do you use Final Cut? And what do you wish Final Cut had? And then Premiere built out all of these tools for professionals. And around that time, uh, Apple's hardware started getting more expensive again. They dropped all of their back-end support, you know, for the networking stuff, uh, for the enterprise stuff. Uh, and a lot of people just went, eh, whatever. And they, they basically, Premiere's pretty good, and they shifted over to Premiere. And when Apple does something like this, where it's like, you know, we know you've been waiting for a decent CPU upgrade for two years. Here it is, and it arrives. And the first thing that happens is somebody goes to render a video. And if you're on, you know, you if you're a pretty frantic kind of, you don't want to, you yeah, and think about that. You know, you you've bought like, a, you've spent several thousand dollars on a laptop. You fire up Premiere or what a Final Cut Pro or whatever you're using. You hit that button. You're like, yeah, this is where my hair blows back. And 
you know, cause I had that experience. I, I, I cut my render time by two thirds in, in, in two processors in the space of about 18 months. And I love AMD Ryzen's. They make me happy. Um, but to to spend that much money on a hardware upgrade that people have waited so long for, and then to have it be like, um, we should have put more cooling in, really sucks. Even if it is only for a small percentage of the user base, that's ugly. That is ugly thermals right there. Yeah, that is some ugly, ugly heat mapping. Well, again, right this there. is all based on one YouTuber who is uh, credible, but mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. not more than one, and so. Uh, you know, I, and even what we do here will not be, you know, definitive. I want to see what you do at PC Perspective. I want to see what another <laughs> does. I'd like to see some people who are used, to, who are really doing this kind of thing, uh, and get some idea of the throttles. I won't uh, the throttling. I won't uh, interrupt your show any longer. I have some work to do to get this set up. Uh, have a great show. But I, so you think this is a reasonable? Uh, I, th I gather you think this is a reasonable test that we'll we'll do on on Saturday. I'm gonna yeah. go get some. Yeah, no. And we're gonna yeah, do it I on, do. not on Premiere, although we are, as you know, a Premiere house. This show is edited with Premiere, mm -hmm. but but I'm gonna do it with Final Cut, uh, presuming that giving Apple every opportunity, that's gonna be optimi best <laughs> optimized for the Apple hardware, and we'll see. We'll it's very kind of you to do so, but it's okay to run your <laughs> applications in a real world scenario because. Think about it. If you don't like synthetic applications or synthetic benchmarks, why in the world would you give Apple the benefit of the doubt by going to Final Cut well, Pro? Well, because I think saying. most people who use this hardware are using Final Cut Pro. Pro. It's 200 bucks. Uh, yeah. It's not a it's not a subscription. There's a lot of reasons why you might want to use Final Cut Pro. Okay. And if you're buying Apple hardware, I would bet you're probably using. I mean, we we use it uh, Premiere on Dells. We yeah. we weren't going to buy that that 2013 Mac Pro, and it turned out that was no. the right decision. <laughs> it was a very good decision. Yeah. 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 Oh, and by goodness. the way, I, that's by the way, Apple did admit that the reason they can't upgrade that thing is thermals. Yep. I don't know. There's 45 watt TPUs and there's 45 watt TPUs and then there's 45 watt TPUs yeah. with discrete GPU and all. Hey, Patrick, do you loose. have one of those temperature guns uh, we can use? Uh, you know, I literally own three of them. Would you bring it to, <laughs> on Saturday? We could, I will put it in my bag. I've just been doing the updates, and this thing is hotter than hell. Right here, yeah. it is burn. It is burning up. I almost well, can't. Then, I almost can't touch it. And I haven't done anything but download files. So, <laughs> so that's so not a good sign. That's not a good sign. <laughs> that's not yeah, a good sign. I mean, that shot from Dave Lee's video where there was the big yeah. smiley face with the giant glowy spot, the giant glowy spot in the middle and the smiley face, yeah. that's basically the processor and whatever venting they have in there. And that's probably a little hotter than it should be. Yeah. Um, is that a real just cat so. or is that a, just something you pop in and try <laughs> This is a real cat. Because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> it looks a little like the Brad Sams pop in, I'm just saying. <laughs> I really wish, I, yeah, somebody quick grab a picture of the cat. <laughs> Thank you guys, uh, I appreciate your time. Um, you know, Ken, for his sins, was tasked with benchmarking the thread for 2950X and the 2990WX. Um, you know, I, I, I feel comfortable in saying at this point after talking with, with Kyle last week that the WX is not only outrageously expensive, but really is something that is for uh, people that are doing workstation class, high power workstation class stuff, uh, and or just have yeah. stacked amounts of money to burn. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, you know, but it's... it's uh, you know, you're talking about how much for that processor? So the the 2990WX is 17.99. That's the 32 core, 64 thread part. <clears throat> Honestly, it's the one that in the build up to this launch that was the most interesting and exciting, right? It was the it was where all the rumors coming of AMD doubling the core count again from from 16 to 32. And what what nobody really realized until we started to get briefed by AMD on this is that it there's a lot of complication that goes along with it, right? There are uh, uh, complications of using the same socket and the same motherboards means that even though you have four dies with four separate memory controllers, you can only access two of them. Even though right. all four dies have access to PCI Express lanes, you only can access two sets of those. Uh, unlike where these 32 core processors exist in the Epic platform, you know, they have eight channel memory support, 128 lanes of PCIe support. Uh, the Threadripper versions have about half that. But maybe more problematic for the part is that when you start to branch outside of the truly 
multi-thread capable, truly like workstation class applications, your 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 offline rendering, mm -hmm. your ray tracing, your uh, video production, stuff like that, you start to find a lot of instances where the processor actually is going to run slower than the 16 mm -hmm. core part, uh, like gaming, for example, even in some um, older uh, handbrake encoders, right? If you're just doing a single instance of those applications. And the reason is that the because two of the two sets of eight cores, right? Remember, there's four separate die on these parts. Um, two of those don't have access to memory. They don't have access to PCIe off of their own uh, silicon. Right. So they have to hop across to the other one. And when you have threads that are, you know, some threads that maybe the Windows scheduler isn't intelligently placing and, and they're, you know, maybe a, it, the worst case scenario is you've got a, a core that has no memory trying to talk with a thread with the other core that has no memory and they both have to go to separate cores in order for these uh, for the data to copy over and transmit and communicate. So there, there are instances where that happens. I don't think that makes the 2990 WX a bad part. It just means mm -hmm. that you need to be more deliberate about what you're buying it for. Uh, right. If you're if you're an enthusiast and you love the idea of having 32 cores, but really you're doing gaming most of the time and 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 some moderate prosumer workloads, you probably don't want to go down that route. Just because every time you game, if you want the best experience possible for the gaming uh, uh, scenarios, you're going to have to uh, enter into game mode, which is something the previous the first gen Threadripper have, but that essentially disables half your cores or disables three quarters of your cores, puts you into an eight or 16 core system, which removes a lot of those uh, uh, bottlenecks or potential problems in performance. But it does mean mm -hmm. you have to reboot machine to get into that mode. And then if you're going to do work again and you want access to all 64 threads, you reboot again. Um, and then I can imagine some scenarios if you're lazy like me, where you'd be like, yeah, this project's only going to take 20 minutes to render anyway. I'll just leave it in 16 core mode, so I don't have to close all these apps and reboot. You, you kind of lose some of the some of the benefit there. So, the the W in that brand, the 2990 WX, is mm -hmm. I think more important than AMD emphasized. Right, like the Threadripper brand right. at the beginning. It's called Ryzen. It's called Threadripper. Maybe this should have been called something like Epic W, like for Epic Workstation, uh, and it would have gotten. More of that uh, emphasis placed on the branding. I mean, they the could branding. have named it the 2900 or the 2990 workstation processor that's going to create problems for you in certain workloads if you're a consumer that just wanted to spend all the money. But that was yeah. tough to fit on the box. Um. <laughs> yep, yep. And on the other side, the 2950X, which is the 16-core part, the analog to the 1950X, uh, is now 899 So it's 100 bucks less uh, of starting MSRP. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can get the 1950X for below that now. Um, it's 16 cores, 32 threads, higher clock speeds, but beyond just higher clock speeds uh, by a couple hundred megahertz, it has Precision Boost 2. It has all the Zen Plus design changes, and Precision Boost 2 is actually more valuable to the 2950 than it is to the 2700X because basically the old version of Precision Boost was if you're using one or two cores, the clock speed just kind of was at its near its top speed. And as soon as you went to like three, four, five cores, the clocks dropped pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, there was a pretty high or steep shelf there. Now it's a much more gradual change. So, you know, if you're, if you're using eight, 10 threads throughout your system, you can expect higher average clock speeds than you would have. Otherwise the latency improvements that you got with the Zen plus are carried over to this. And it, it does, there are many instances in which the 2950X 16 core part from AMD is now matching or near matching and in a couple of cases better than the 7980XE from Intel, which is the 18 core part um, Skylake X. No. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, but, but it does that even though, you know, we know that the inherent IPC advantages belong, belong to Intel in that space. And that right. 7980XE is still like $2,000 part. So uh, I, I still think that the second gen Threadripper launch is good. Like these are good products, uh, but I think there's mm -hmm. a little bit more confusion and a there needs to be a little bit more deliberate discussion about the difference between the X series and the WX series. And maybe we right. had, we thought we were going to have to have. At some level, is there going to need to be optimization in some applications to take advantage of this, this uh, excess of cores, if you will? Um, because <laughs> I mean, when it's you really going to be at the OS level. Yeah, that's what I'm, or at the, at the, so it's more the OS than the actual applications themselves. Yeah, I mean, so 
so here's the thing. Like the, the AMD tried to make this as good as possible. So if you look at the 2990, it's it's separated into four Newman nodes, right? So mm -hmm. four different memory segments. And in theory, Windows should apply should only should place threads on the cores that have access to memory first. So they they put those, you know, that's node zero and node one uh, before it goes into node two and three that ha don't have access to memory. Um, it doesn't work perfectly in Windows 10 today. It may work a little bit better in Windows Server than it does in Windows 10. Right. The but th there's still a lot of room for fixes in that. There's still a lot of room to optimize. There's room to um, you know, give the operating system a little bit more of a peek inside the architecture so it knows these types of things. I could also imagine um, what I would like to see is for for some applications, say the operating system doesn't really change and the applications, um, some of them can be complicated, like say games, for example, right? Like, you know, games mm -hmm. are going to create a whole bunch of threads. They may not uh, be aware enough to say, make sure I'm always on the same NUMA node or what have you. The... Right. If there was a piece of software that you could, you know, it, this is an extra step that you don't want to have to do, but as like kind of an interim step, if you open up this piece of software and say, every time I start Far Cry 5, it only has access to these eight cores, right? If you could do that and have it, have it automatically set the affinity of that application that way, that would help a lot. Uh, and I think that, I mean, it's something AMD is aware of, but I think it's just a really complex software problem to solve uh, when you're not the developer of the OS and or all of those applications that you're trying to fix. All you have to do is fix everything yeah. everywhere simultaneously <laughs> before For it everybody ships. else. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's interesting to look at, the, at some of the benchmarks where, you know, it goes from having this staggering lead, um, you know, it, you know, POV Ray 3.7.0, um, where it's not quite, but uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's uh, not quite twice as fast as a Core i9 7980XE, but it's you know in the neighborhood. Um, and then you keep scrolling down, like you know, uh, in Blender, lower is better, and POV Ray, uh, larger is better, and you know that's a pretty significant lead. Uh, you know, and then you get to sort of you know X264 benchmark X264 benchmark 5.0.1, and the Threadripper 2950X is actually outperforming the Threadripper 2990WX, um, despite having half the number of cores. And it's a really interesting, like, oh, oh, there are issues yeah. there. How thrilling! Mm -hmm. um, you know, is was gaming just kind of silly to do on this? Was there any point? Because I, I, most games are still like, I still feel like a quad core game is kind of like something to celebrate, um, which is not, <laughs> you know, a, a, last year probably a quad core game was something to celebrate. I think they're becoming yeah. more common now, but, um, you know, uh, it was, was it just a ridiculous tool for gaming? I mean, it, it, the 2950 X <laughs> was still, was still better, right? The 20, there are some games where the 2990 and you'll see for the 2990 WX, there's two data points. There's the default uh, and then there's the gaming mode where we took it down to eight cores. And in some instances, like Wildlands there, uh, if you remember back to the original Threadripper launch, there were some games that right. just wouldn't start if you had too many threads. Wildlands is right. one of those. It works now with a 16 core. It doesn't work with the 32 core. So, you know, still <laughs> a little bit more modifications to go. There are some games with the 2990 and the 2950 <laughs> are neck and neck. There are some where right. without the gaming mode enabled, the 2990 is, you know, half the speed or significantly slower. And that's all because of the the latency issues that come up across right. threads that aren't on the same Newman node trying trying to communicate. So yeah, GTA Hardwood. 5 is, is one of those examples, right? So you can see the 2990 only pulls in 45 frames per second, but when you turn on game mode, that jumps up to 94, uh, right. which is obviously a huge difference. Uh, you don't Hardwood. have to worry about that as much with the 2950. Part of this makes me laugh is this is such an example of, you know, there are games that really aren't CPU bound and boy, what a demonstration, uh, especially like Civilization VI, um, <laughs> where, where obviously CPU power is not the challenge there. I mean, it's, you know, technically the, the Threadrippers uh, were faster, but you're still talking about a variation from 12.8 on a Ryzen 7 2700X uh, up to 14.9 uh, frames per second. Um that's not a huge delta given the price difference in the range of parts on that screen. Um, more so on the GPU side of things. But it's, you know, uh, 
I, I've never actually had a chance to say horses for courses out loud on a podcast ever. <laughs> so you heard it here first, but this is really, you know, this is not the horse for that course. Um, you know, gaming is an afterthought on this, uh, you know, a well, actually a well thought out afterthought on this, given that they put the gaming mode in there. But, um, yeah. I also love the, uh, uh, if you go to the the last page, the overclocking section, the software, um, <laughs> where it's showing the the Ryzen Master overclocking software in place. Keep scrolling, keep scrolling. There it is. Click on that one. You know, in case you're wondering what a visual uh, look at 32 <laughs> cores <laughs> looks like. Yeah, That's it's a little bit of data overload, huh? Just a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. That's just a lot of cores, people. I, I you know, I, 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 thumbs up. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it didn't win the. It's, it, it's funny because the, the 2950X uh, got an editor's choice. The 2990WX got a, a silver award. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I think you, you know, you know who you are. Uh, if you need right. a 2990 WX, uh, and if you aren't thinking like this will solve this problem in my office and I will be able to take lunch breaks once again and leave <laughs> before midnight, <laughs> right. that's your part. Yep. Um, if you're thinking like Warcraft would be totally bitching on this, it is not your part. Uh, and yep. you should donate that money to a, a worthy charity. Um, interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. Yep. Will you be buying a uh, 2990WX for use in the office? Um, that was a big sigh. I don't. I don't know. It, pro, I mean, so I, I, honestly, the the software you use, Adobe, doesn't utilize it as well as it should, right? right. And that that's a reason why we switched from a two socket Xeon server to a one socket 18 core 7980XE when we did. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't do as well with the Numa node problems, which is which are the same problems that exist when you switch when you go to multi socket configurations too. So um, I want to see some more software optimization on that side. Uh, but you know, I think a 2950x would probably be something that I would consider putting in there because it, you can put it all in one Numa mode, new one node, uh, unified memory address space, and then it has higher clock speeds and all the latency efficiency improvements to go along with it. That's probably where I'd go. Uh, there was an Anon Tech story, actually, that talked about Huawei cheating in benchmarks. Now, they were doing testing on the 970, not the 980, because the 980 is not out yet. But they found that in some graphics tests, specifically in some gaming tests, that the 970 was... Yeah, you can scroll that second graph there. Shows you an idea of the performance delta in, quote, cheating mode and non-cheating mode. Whoa. And... Um, they were basically allowing, they were detecting when a benchmark was happening and they would let it use a higher thermal dissipation than they would otherwise, right? So instead of using four and a half watts, they'd use eight watts of power, which obviously in a short run test is, you know, it's usable, right? Like you can, you can right. do that. The phone didn't catch on fire. The battery didn't explode or something like that, but it's not Always realistic plus. because that's not it's not what somebody's going to do when they're actually gaming, right? They're, it's it's going to be right. limited. And what this tweet that I sent out was was not about the Nantech story that kind of started the discussion down there, but it was actually FutureMark, which is now UL Benchmarks, um, delisted some Huawei phones from their 3D Mark and uh, other benchmarks because of this, the P20 uh, Pro, the Nova 3, and the Honor Play results were removed because of that graph that you see there. Basically, they did their own internal testing, and they created a different version of the app that you know basically presented itself to the operating system differently so that it wouldn't be detected by the custom OS on, Huawei, um, on Huawei's phones. It was running the exact same workloads, but you can see the huge drop. You get a score of 2988 going down to 1930, for example, in these, in these particular scores. And that's a big deal for them. And and these benchmark companies, especially somebody like UL who's been around forever, they depend on their ratings and um, you know, the fairness of their tests to be accurate. And uh this was not the case. The, you know, so they pulling pulling devices like this is a pretty significant, pretty significant uh a move for them. You know, um, they linked to they sent out an email blast, linked to their, you know, 
uh, rules and regs for manufacturers to follow. They talk about right. detection and optimizations forbidden. And it's, it was, it was, uh, it was an impressive move on their part to do it. And I think a little bit damaging, not maybe not a little bit, but pretty damaging for Huawei and the Kirin line, especially since they just made a big announcement about all these performance claims on right. their new chip. And now you kind of go, well, I guess we'll wait and see if that turns out to be the case. Well, it's, oh man, it's, it, you know, this is, this level of cheating on a benchmark is, is something I haven't even heard of since, uh, like back in the, you know, the, the Davis benchmark days. Um, and the, yeah. those benchmarks were, were really insane because, um, they had a huge influence on, on, you know, what PC Mag used to call brand specifiers, people who made decisions at large companies or, you know, in a house and two, um, they spent a tremendous amount of money. They're this industry standard at the time. I mean, I literally was offered, um, it, it was a month before I realized it, uh, it really, when I sort of played the conversation, this conversation back in my head and was like, wait a minute, <laughs> that person just offered me a half million dollars for a beta copy of the benchmark so they could prep their machines, you know, basically, and what they would do as soon as the benchmarks would release, Everybody from Dell and Micron and Gateway and all these other PC companies that have been gone for a long time, um, you know, they would have their teams would sit down and rage through configurations till they figured out which ones did the best jobs uh, for the for the given benchmarks. And the upside of that was the benchmarks were actually based on real world applications, um, right. real world applications that that would not use up a single core on a contemporary processor. But back in the day, they were pretty challenging. Um, and it was incredibly competitive. And, you know, some of the graphics benchmarks we we call, you know, people were caught cheating, you know, basically, you know, and this is, it, this is a, a, a relatively brute force, inelegant way of doing it. Like a benchmark is running uh -huh. uh, on the upside. It's, it's doing it. They're not, you know, they're not actually like lying and, 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 you know, substituting information, but they are creating a, an unrealistic, uh, performance expectation. Um, at least if right. you, you think you should be able to run at that performance for less than the X number of seconds the benchmark takes, um, you know. It's very similar uh, if, if you go back, no, no, if you go back 15, 18 years, there was, uh, ATI was caught cheating back in the day. Um, it was the Quake Quack thing. Do you remember this? Oh, um, yeah. Where, you know, Quake was the big benchmark, right? And right. Uh, Quake 3 and what they did was they did some optimizations specific for that game that lowered the quality of some of the texture maps or the uh, anisotropic filtering at the time that was very important. And because the bit one, it was a time demo and it ran very fast. So it was hard for any person watching it to it really see that the quality. Right, exactly. So <laughs> what happened was people realized if you just simply rename the executable from Quake 3 to Quack 3, and did it, you would have significant impact on performance. And that's right. when people started to realize what was happening. And, you know, they went back and changed things and it's a, it's a whole different world. And, you know, this is, this is incredibly unfortunate. It's, it's good that there are people out there checking for it. It's mm -hmm. good that there are benchmark companies that are, that are holding people, you know, their feet to the fire and taking them to task for these types of things. And it's something to, to, to watch for and keep an eye on as we move forward. We can think everything is is above board, and that you know we, we've solved all problems, but clearly, clearly not the case. It, it's disappointing and it's frustrating. Um, you know, it, it, you'd think this isn't happening anymore, but apparently it still is. But, um, well, you know, it, there's there's you know people want to be competitive. There's money to be made. They want an advantage in the marketplace. Yep. And the reality is, most people aren't really stressing their hardware in a way that they would kind of be able to you know manually detect the difference in performance. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I'm. I props to the benchmarking company for you know really shutting the door down on this and trying to make it you know trying yep. to you know keep the keep it as a legitimate uh, benchmark tool. Everybody I talked to right earlier this week um, made the rounds, as it were, uh, and there was some conjecture about the performance of the GTX 2080, or as I like to call it, the RTX 2080. Um, the uh, well, let's talk about the new GPUs from from NVIDIA, right? Because it's that's kind of the big thing this week, um, by far. Yep. The 2080 yep. shipping, the 2080 Ti is delayed at least a week. The 2070, we have no idea when it will ship. 
there are no RTX games. Um, the update to the Tomb Raider game is going to be the first ray trace, like live RTX ray tracing enabled game. Uh, we're waiting for the patch on that. Uh, the first like new game, Battlefield Five, is going to ship in November. Kind of slipped in November, uh, but should be available in November. Um, so RTX games are starting, or we are hoping they will be trickling out. Uh, card availability is not awful. Uh, MSRP, uh, they're actually all really within about $50 of MSRP, the third-party cards that are still available. Mm. Uh, I was laughing on Tuesday because as we shot uh, Tech Thing, all of the sales uh, pages on uh, NVIDIA's website disappeared, and uh, which I thought was really amusing. Like all of a sudden, you couldn't even you know try to order a 2080. Um, <laughs> but let's let's talk about you know RTX 2080, RTX 2080 Ti. Um, I you know I feel like I'm going to guess here if you are a 4K gamer and you are if you have a 4K monitor and you want all the pixels. The 2080 Ti is attractive. Um, yep. The 2080, I believe you said, was on parity with a 1080 Ti when we were talking in pre-show, like 30% yeah, above a 1080. Okay. Um, how are you feeling about these cards right now? Because in, in one sense, on today's games, you're getting a healthy bump in exchange for a healthy increase in cost. Um, yeah. Yeah. So if we we can we can talk about the the fundamental architectural stuff a uh, second because the 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 performance of the cards is good but I think not the revolutionary thing that a lot of people were expecting. If you remember back to the to the launch stream when right. when you know the CEO Jensen was on stage talking about the products, they didn't really talk about anything except ray tracing performance. They didn't really dive into anything about the games that you can play today and what that performance level would look like. Then a couple of days later. Um, they put out, they let the media put out like one slide that showed performance, but it was a little bit, uh, not, not, not misconstrued. It was a little bit kind of calculated of a move because mm -hmm. they included a lot of HDR performance in that, uh, and the HDR performance on the 10 series has a little bit of a performance hit, whereas on the 20 series it doesn't. So it kind of expands that gap, uh, quite a bit. And, you know, they were obviously picking the, the games that looked the best for them. They also, NVIDIA, yeah, that, that document right there. NVIDIA um, likes to compare the GTX 1080 to the RTX 2080, again, which that graphic right there is doing. And that, that makes sense from a naming scheme uh, and kind of from a GPU, uh, like a relative GPU die configuration standpoint. In other words, like the... This is GT104, and that's we're comparing it to GP104. Um, but the from the, from the community standpoint, from you know gamers and reviewers and enthusiasts, uh, what we have been used to doing over the last couple of generational leaps is comparing, you know, the 80 versus the previous TI. Right, so if you go right. back to when uh, the 980 Ti came out and it replaced the GTX 780, or it supplanted the GTX 780, and then when the GTX 1080 came out, it was you know quite a bit faster while also being quite a bit more efficient than the GTX 980. And in this case, if you make that same comparison, if you go with the RTX 2080 and compare it to the GTX 1080 Ti, um, mm -hmm. you don't really get those. You don't get that same difference. Um, the Efficiency, the power consumption is pretty close. The the RTX 2080 is a little bit more power efficient, but not a whole lot. Um, maybe 10 watts less power draw in our in our testing. And then from a performance standpoint, it's pretty much a dead even race between the RTX 2080 and the GTX 1080 Ti. And I would say it leans in favor of the RTX 2080 by a handful of percent, five or less. And there are a couple of cases where the 1080 Ti is actually faster. Um, so it is, it's a mixed bag in terms of that performance uh, comparison. And then when you bring in the pricing into it, that's when things get pretty messy because the RTX 2080, the Founders Edition, the one that you know NVIDIA sent out for review, is $799, I believe, right? Um, right? Which means that if you compare that to the launch price of the GTX 1080 Ti, it was... Um, six ninety nine, right? So for a hundred dollars right. more, Founders Edition versus Founders Edition, 
you are you are getting a almost equivalent performance, maybe a little bit better, maybe a little bit more efficiency. So you're paying more for that. The the te technologically speaking, you're getting a lot more out of the RTX card. You're getting G GDDR6 memory. Uh, it's running at you know 1,400 gigabits per second or 14,000 gigabits per second instead of uh, 11,000. You get your memory bandwidth goes from 484 gigabytes per, sec per second to 616 gigabytes per second. Uh, your peak theoretical compute goes from 10.6 to 13.4. 12 to 18 billion transistors. There's a lot more technology going on in the RTX 2080 than in the GTX 1080 Ti. Mm -hmm. But most of that appears to be tied up in the ray tracing capability and the AI capability of the Turing GPU, which, as you brought up at the beginning of the discussion, is not accessible in any actual games you can play today. And uh, uh, that's kind of problematic. So we're looking at these cards. Um, we're looking at a premium price, in part because it's the Founders Edition, and and Nvidia's gotten into the habit of extracting kind of a a payday. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe that's not the nicest way of saying it, but you know they 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 kind of release the first round of these cards. They're overclocked. Um, they're more expensive, uh, you know, by a, a yeah. fairly large you know percentage of value, um, and. I, I think it's you know they're they're turning a big ship, you know they're kind of moving us from where we've been uh, in the last several years to real time race racing. They've made some, it's, I mean it's amazing to realize how complicated these cards are and how sophisticated the technology yep. is. Um, I, you know I just wish there was more RTX content available or RTX ready content available at chip because um, none of these are bad cards in terms of existing gaming performance. Uh, and certainly, if you're if you're moving a metric ton of pixels on a 4K monitor, uh, you know you'll probably be staring at that 2080 Ti, going like, "I'm I'm good. Come on, come on. <laughs> I got it. Cut me the check, um, or I'll cut yeah. you a check." Um, uh, just because it's it's a it's a pretty healthy bump, but uh, you know, you we were talking last week. You don't or the week before. You don't feel because one of the one of the, the 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 pundits was claiming that you know early 2019 we were going to be seeing a um, you know a massive process drop and a massive uh, you know decrease in power consumption and increase in performance uh, probably a reduction in price. Um, does that sound like somebody writing a title to get traffic, or does that sound like something that might actually happen next year? I mean, are, should be, I mean, obviously, we should probably most people should wait until after the Founders Edition and, and get the regular edition of the card. Um, do we even have an idea when that's going to show up? Um, so it depends on what you mean by regular. In terms of just like right. third-party AIC cards, add-in card vendors, you know, custom coolers, all that. Th those are available already, right? You, you'll see them right. for sale in Newegg and, and Amazon. We have we have a handful here. If you're talking about normal being the Price lower models, you know. Um, yes. Remember that one. This is interesting in that the the founders edition this time is more expensive than the base, which it was before, but it's also overclocked out of the box as opposed to running at kind of quote unquote the reference speeds, which creates a different dynamic, right? Because before the founders editions were base clocks, but um, uh, more expensive, and we kind of looked at it as okay, Nvidia wanted to create cards, they wanted to build their own for people that just want the one directly from NVIDIA, but they didn't want to step on their partner's feet by um, competing at the at the same performance level, even though we all know they're all overclockable and, and whatever. So this time they said, look, we're going to charge more for them. We need to be in the same performance uh, kind of segment as our partner cards that are overclocked out of the box. So they, they did at that time. And if you remember the with the 10 series, it was it was pretty rare to find a card that was that quote unquote base MSRP price. And I feel like we're gonna mm -hmm. see the same thing here. Uh, as far as I know, we haven't seen any out today. This is again day one, so not uncommon for that to be the case. But in my mind, there's not really unless unless these don't sell well, there's not a lot mm -hmm. of reason for card partners to want to stretch down the stack. Right. If Nvidia has kind right. of set the bar at 799 for the 2080 and 1199 for the 2080 Ti, you know, even if you've got your base model, 
if they're hard to find and they're and they're going to sell through, why would you sell it for less? Now we don't have the complication of the uh, cryptocurrency mining fiasco going on at this point, which is something that that haunted both the 10 series products and you know the Radeon Vega products as well. Um, so it's it, it's kind of an it's a different thing. I I worry that we won't see 699 versions of 2080. For the foreseeable future, or what is it supposed to be? Nine ninety nine for the twenty eighty Ti uh, uh, mm -hmm. reference. But you know, if if they if these aren't selling out in a month, then I think you maybe you maybe will see see some of that. Um, so in terms of should you wait, I think you should should wait. It always makes sense not to buy day one, but day thirty <laughs> and then day sixty is when you start to go. Okay, how much is are things going to change from the status of right. that day? And we'll have to see see where we're at but i get the impression that these are going to sell fine and is going to do do well they don't have a lot of competition to to push back on them but um oh you know, check we got to keep checking on availability i guess from that from that mindset uh china puts chips in micro server or super micro servers um what's going on with this i mean this is uh, i am essentially what bloomberg saying is that that china um, reached into the servers of like 30 U.S. companies, uh, stuff at Amazon, at at Apple. Um, oh man, I just I, sorry, <laughs> this is big. Um, yeah, and it's worth, know, it's, it's it, worth noting right off the bat that uh, uh, Amazon has denied it like mm -hmm. pretty strongly that, that, that they had any awareness of, of this going on. And obviously all the sources for the story are uh, anonymous government agency representatives or anonymous Apple executives or anonymous Amazon executives. But the, the general synopsis of this is that Supermicro, which is one of, if not the largest provider of server OEM technologies and capabilities to companies mm -hmm. around the globe, uh, was either responsible or allowed the Chinese government to place a tiny, tiny, tiny microchip on board designs. And mm -hmm. um, this chip was apparently even small enough in some cases that it would fit in between PCB layers. So in terms of like even Whoa. physically discovering it was, was pretty much impossible. And that this chip... Uh, sat between the firmware and the processor for the post sequence and basically allowed it to insert code where it wanted to. And it could alter the operating system in a way that it would allow uh, access to uh, other other computers and, and compromise the networks and a whole bunch of stuff. And a lot of this is the the amount of logic you can put on a chip this small was is obviously minimal, and so it really just kind of was a was a door opening for access to uh, other things that way. And this this story actually kind of goes back into like 2014 through 2015 through 2016. Remember Elemental, a company mm -hmm. that um, does video processing gear. They were apparently, you know compromised by this because they were buying their servers from Supermicro and rebranding them and Amazon bought Elemental and uh, apparently Amazon discovered this issue or some portion of this issue when they did their security uh, analysis of the company before they bought it. Um, there's other, you know, potentially problematic things in that Elemental as a company who was making the most advanced video processing technology was selling into the DOD. They were selling into uh, all aspects of military and government institutions. Because you, as you would imagine, I don't think they said this in the story, but I, if you imagine uh, in, in an environment, a situation where you want really highly compressed, very fast video, it might be from like, say, a drone feed. Um, Maybe. If you're... If you're if you're flying one of those around, so there are a lot of implications here. Apple is is implicated in this. Not that they did anything wrong, but that they were they had at one point seven or eight thousand super micro servers running in their data centers. Um, the accusation in the story from Bloomberg is that Apple discovered or they that basically the government went to all these companies, about thirty of them, that had mm -hmm. been they had traced back to being using to to using these servers. They've been compromised, and then these they did it all very quietly because they didn't want to, you know, let 
the people on the other side know that they had figured out what was going on and uh, Apple slowly removed uh, super all of the super microservice from its data center and replaced it. But when it did it, it, you know, it blamed it all on like uh, pricing issues or contract negotiations or what have you. So <laughs> it's a fairly, it's a really good story to read. It is uh, as someone who is currently watching the TV show Homeland. Um, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> seems very familiar, right? The kind of the CIA right. spy era synopsis of it. Um, but it's, it's, I, I think what I found most interesting about it is there are, I think there are 17 or 18 sources that Bloomberg has in this, all of them anonymous, of course, but 17 or 18 sources um, that talk about, yes, this happened at Apple. Yes, this happened at Amazon. The government had these meetings in Virginia where they they brought these companies in. Uh, they were able, the reason they, they, the, how they found all the companies that were compromised was that they found a system that had this. They figured out what machine it was home uh, uh, calling home back to. It compromised that machine and figured out where all the signals it was getting were from. And that's where they, they kind of backtracked their way into these, into these 30 companies. But Amazon is, you know, Posted their CIO chief. Uh, I think it was their CIO uh, put out mm -hmm. uh, a post today on their website about no, nothing from AWS has ever been affected by this. We've never been contacted by the government. We've uh, never found any trace of compromised hardware. Everything that they're saying is a fabrication, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the drama around the story might be more interesting in the long term. Um, you know, except for the fact that that maybe all these networks have been compromised and. Secrets have been stolen and governments and and whatnot. So that's uh, that's been the whole day here. How about you? <laughs> yeah, that's not exciting at all. Um, I <sighs> I've, the story I've does a good job of going into things about like how a a, a well done hardware level implant is significantly more damaging than uh, any software, you know, implementation yeah. of, a, of a hack, right? And, it, it, you know, they go into as much detail as you can in, in a Bloomberg story, um, but there's, there's, there's a lot of information in here. So it's worth checking it's, out. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's some of the stuff you look at. Um, you know, means I, 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 I am friends with a number of hackers and pen testers and security professionals. And, you know, we, we shoot tech thing in the Hack 5 studio. Um, you know, and it's amazing to realize, you know, just giving a window into a piece of hardware onto a network or, or it's just um, frightening to comprehend what could be done with that. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, the uh, NVIDIA GeForce RTX 2070 review. You guys got an EVGA card in. What uh, what was the findings? And once Mr. Addison was done with the benchmarking and the weeping and the counseling and all the <laughs> stuff that goes into a, a, a benchmarking session at PC Per, well, actually, I guess technically he didn't need counseling this time. But how'd it go? No, no, uh, not not because time. it was 2070 versus 1080. Where are you leaning at this point? Yeah, because that's kind of where we've been seeing them fall, right? Usually the, the new generation, you go one rung up from the previous generation on that line, and that's kind of your starting point of where the, you'd kind of expect the performance to sit. Um, that was the case here, uh, and then some. We were seeing like probably 5 or 10% better um, for the from the 2070. That's on top of a GTX 1080. Um, and that's just, you know, testing various titles, uh, you know, just various current games, uh, current game titles. Uh, we tested at um, 1440p and 4K. Um, you know, just it's funny, even with this kind of a lower end card, you don't really need mm -hmm. to, if you go down to 1080p, that card's just going to scream. Um, you know, so definitely uh, playable with games with decent settings at 1440p and even... You can even get up upwards into the 4K range depending on what you're playing and where you have your settings setting. So uh, the the interesting point here uh, is that of the prices that we've seen for the 2000 series NVIDIA cards, um, you know they did this at their launch. They had 
Founders Edition cards, which were 100 or even $200 above what the like standard price for the cards should be. Uh, but we haven't really seen any cards hit the standard prices from, you know, for example, 2080 Ti's or 2080s. Uh, however, for the 2070, the first card we reviewed is a CVGA card. Uh, I believe it's a Black Edition uh, 2070. Um is actually selling for five hundred bucks, which is I was going to say the um, you know, I'm, that's I'm the price on, that was supposed to launch at, right? No, no, um, I'm with you. I'm up on Newegg, like EVGA, Asus, MSI, Gigabytes, all have cards at four hundred ninety nine ninety nine. Um, right, there's right. a couple more expensive um, cards out there, but yeah, you can actually like, buy the cards at the price. Yes, yes, you can buy the cards <laughs> at the price. Uh, that's that's good, right? Um, it is still, you still have to take into consideration that, you know, it's been a couple of years and at that particular price point, we're still kind of getting this amount of performance, right? Because if you think back, you know, the, the 1080, which is what we're comparing this card to that went for around 500 bucks. Um, so that part of it is kind of disappointing, but it is what it is. That's the, kind of the whole graphics card landscape right now, partially due to Bitcoin. And I guess it's mainly due to Bitcoin still. I don't know. It it should be coming down. I don't understand why it's not at the, by this point because it's uh, you know, the profitability has come down on a lot of stuff. So there's not mobs of people just scraping up batches of uh, graphics cards off the market and kind of driving prices up for everybody. At least not anymore, as far as I know. Um, either way, uh, you have decent cards at you know decent performance levels for at the price point of five hundred dollars, and for the uh, RTX cards in particular, even though it's all the way down, you know, a few rungs down from the top of the line model, uh, this card does still have the RTX cores. It does still have Turing. Granted, it's a smaller one. Um, it will still be able to do ray tracing in some way, shape, or form once, uh, you know, supported by titles that that come out. Um, mm -hmm. So you still have those extra bells and whistles that you can't take advantage of yet necessarily but they're there so right. uh between between that uh that little tidbit the performance gain over a 1080 uh the price being reasonably close um i'd basically say you know if you have a 1080 or even a 1080 ti don't run out and like buy an mm -hmm. rtx card not yet um you know, if anything, give them a little more time to come down in price. But if you're looking for, you're in the market for a graphics card right now, uh, and you're okay with this particular performance level, which is really not too shabby at all, um, then it's probably worth considering going this route, you know, 2070 route versus going after a, a 1080, which would probably be close in price. Um, mm -hmm. But you wouldn't get those extra features that, might give you a, a, a more enhanced experience, you know, moving forward uh, with some future titles. Looking at these benchmarks, um, you can honestly say that even without heavily tweaked benchmarks or heavily tweaked competition or, or, or basically in, you know, blunt, honest benchmarks that, you know, this pretty much is the fastest gaming processor you can buy. Um, yes. Yes, that is, that is still uh, seems to be a true statement. Absolutely. Personally, I'm buying a $329 Ryzen 7 2700X before I'm buying a Core i9 9900K. Um, yes, which is and that is know. because of the value proposition as opposed to yeah. the ultimate performance proposition, right? Like you know, that's a you can get a Ryzen part for significantly less money. Um, well, let's tell you, Cinebench R15 single threaded. I mean, that's where I think it's probably one of the glory benchmarks for the 9900K, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, but again, I mean, that's Cinebench. It's not gaming, right? You got to got to really think of. Like, I spend a lot of time your, rendering, so workload. rendering benchmarks is is always kind of a a big thing for me. But when you're looking at that, I mean, well, okay. So I can't see the top of the benchmark right now. What are we looking at? Ashes of the Singularity Escalation 1080p. <laughs> Obviously not CPU right, not bound. A, yeah, there's not a huge spread there, right? Um, mm -hmm. And again, that's only running a 1080p, but granted, it's Ashes, which is, you know, it's kind of a, a decently heavy workload where even a 1080p, right. the GPU is still doing a, a decent amount of work there uh, to the point where it kind of diminishes 
uh, the spread that you see on the CPU side. That's just mm -hmm. that's just generally how benchmarks in general work, right? There's usually a, a bottleneck someplace, depending on whatever the workload is. Uh, and sometimes you're kind of right on the fine line there. like, And that's very much the case in just modern systems where sometimes the bottleneck for one given uh, given game might be the CPU, whereas you might fire up mm -hmm. a different game or just slightly different settings and the bottleneck might shift over to the GPU where you might see a, you know, and then suddenly the CPU doesn't matter as much, right? And then it's really right. down to the point of, you know, does it get the job done reasonably quickly? And if so, performance will be just fine, right? Um, but that said, I mean, just generally speaking across CPUs, like eh, CPUs usually, you know, do okay. Like it's, it's, a CPU is not some, some super critical thing uh, right. in modern day games where, you know, it's just, it's a game. It's trying to render things to the display. It makes more sense that the the workload would be a little bit heavier on the GPU side anyway. Um, but there are some cases like right there where it's what's scrolling by and Civ. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, that game seems to be leaning a little more on the CPU, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then you do see a spread. And in that case, uh, that 9900K is, is just is able to dominate the field, right? Um, right. But, you know, but... Uh, it's it is a spread there. Like it's you can't really argue that it's not a huge difference when uh, you know that twenty seven hundred X. You're, you're talking like what is that like fifteen, uh, almost tw actually it's like a twenty percent reduction. Yeah. When you drop down to that that part, but again, that's only if you're after that one particular workload slash game, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're more on a budget, that that part could, you know, still be for you and can still get the job done, right? Um, so do things change as you as you move out of 1080p performance or did you guys kind of avoid looking at, you know, 4K performance? I guess there probably wasn't much point. You wouldn't be... Oh, yeah, at that I mean, point, as, you, as you shift... GPU. Yeah, as you shift up there, the the, perform, the the delta pretty much evaporates on the CPU mm -hmm. side um, when you get into... If you get all the way up to 4K resolutions... Um, I'm not sure if uh, Ken did uh, 1440p in this particular piece or not, or just decided to focus on 1080p. I think for time uh, time considerations, he stuck with the 1080p. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we will also show the next rung up on resolution to kind of give an idea of what the, you know where where is the point where that bottleneck shifts. Um, but probably safe to say that you know once you had 1440p or above in in modern titles, you, you know as long as you're uh, as long as your frame rates are still going to be sticking somewhere around 60, mm -hmm. uh, you know, then uh, again, CPUs kind of become a wash. Um, so let's see. Uh, there was an iometer test. Actually, I was I worked with Ken briefly on this one to just uh, mm -hmm. we're trying to show like, is there a way to see what change happens due to this whole Spectre and Meltdown thing? Because Spectre and Meltdown. If, uh, affects storage related performance pretty heavily, um, right. especially like random access and whatnot. And we were trying to figure out, well, there's supposed to be some changes and some variants of Spectre and Meltdown or mitigated and hardware on, on this revision versus on, you know, previous, uh, previous Intel CPUs. Like, what can we do? And I was, and I just thought to myself, well, you could just run something like Iometer on a RAM disk. Just run on something where you know that the limit is not really, you know, you want the CPU to be the bottleneck. And uh, mm -hmm. I just know from personal experience using tools like Iometer that there's actually a case where uh, a single thread can only do so many random operations per second, uh, you know, at such a high rate before the storage is no longer the bottleneck and now the CPU is. So same story as before where we're talking about the bottleneck being a CPU or GPU for a game. For storage performance, it's either the storage or the CPU, depending on you know what you're doing and what kind of workload it is. So we set up a workload that was going to go after uh, sort of to, to evaluate the CPU's ability to handle storage in in a given version of Windows and with the given state of the Spectre and Meltdown landscape. Um, and looking at those results, so we were testing reads and writes because the Spectre Meltdown stuff impacts reads and writes differently. Um, there were some things that were surprising to me because... Uh, our standard storage test bed uh, is still like this X99 system that was reasonably beefy at the time, like the CPU is overclocked. And we try to, when we do our storage testing, we don't want the CPU to be the bottleneck, right? Um, mm -hmm. 
back when I was tuning that system and setting up all those workloads, uh, the, the maximum IOPS that a single thread could hit on that particular system, again, like high-end system, but a few years back, the, it would saturate at like 200,000, 220,000, something like that. Uh, right. And now we have like modern processors like 9900K, they're doing almost, well, a little bit under and a little bit over 400,000. So like storage performance is nearly doubled in, in relation to how quickly can the system turn that, that request around? Um, how quickly can it get through all the different steps that a request for information has to go through, through the whole kernel and, you know, and all those links in the chain has to make, you know, make it through all the layers out to the device and then back, right? Um, so just an interesting tidbit there. Um, also interesting is uh, that there is kind of a penalty that the Ryzen slash Threadripper CPUs see. Uh, probably, it's not necessarily because of optimizations or just how modern they are. It's really just because there's extra latency penalties related with the way that things have to, the way that, uh, you know, information has to transit between the RAM and the cores on those on those platforms. Uh, this is, you know, that infinity fabric latency related thing that we're always talking about when we when we deal with the AMD side. Um, so it's kind of just a limitation of the architecture. And you can actually, I know Ken did do testing there, but like if you were to do things like overclock the memory further on the Threadripper systems or on the AMD systems, you might actually bring those numbers higher. Um, you know, it's just it, the bottleneck sort of becomes the the fabric within the CPU and whatnot. It anyway, seems like... Um, you know, all that all that stuff aside, uh, it really comes down to, you know, if you want if you want the fastest thing, right? Uh, this is kind of your bet, but you're gonna have to pay for it, right? Uh, the price is supposed mm -hmm. to be around five hundred dollars, but so far yeah, we've only seen it. We've only seen it for like what five eighty, yeah, yeah. Um, so definitely don't buy one right this moment, even if you're interested in it. It's probably worth <laughs> waiting a few weeks to, for hopefully that price to become a little bit more sane, right? Um, uh, but and, and, well, and the other thing is like, while most of the people who are listening to this podcast would probably automatically buy an aftermarket air cooler or an aftermarket liquid cooler, um, it's you know you're talking like right now 580, maybe it'll be down to 530. You're absolutely going to have to buy an aftermarket cooler for this. There's no cooler in the box on this one. Um, right. I also, I mean, looking at the benchmarks, it seems like anything you're doing that's got a ton of I/O is going to have an advantage running under the, the 9900K, um, you know, like workstation type stuff or content creation type stuff, um, you know, which for me is like the, the whole focus of this has been gaming. Um, but, you know, there's there's some pretty impressive, you know, performance attributes to this that are not just straight, you know, four threads or smaller uh, CPU abuse. Um, right. Which is pretty impressive. Yeah, so you know the best thing I can suggest to you is just you know look at your budget. This is just the, your general like CPU buying advice. They'll like look at your budget. Right. How much do you want to spend? What's your use cases? What kinds of things are you going to do with the system? And then go through a review like Ken's or anybody else for that matter. If you don't you know don't, don't always just look at one review, but you should probably look at several to get the the bigger picture. Um, mm -hmm. And once you've, you know, look for the particular benchmarks that are going to be close to the kinds of things you see yourself doing with it. And okay, which thing looks like the best thing? Let's talk about SSD hardware encryption, which everybody's been, well, you know, I'm selling it and the, the storage is soldered down on the motherboard, but I'll just encrypt it before it goes and that'll take care of everything. And the register does not want you to, well... I'm just going to read the title that I that I want, Alan. I'm going to just step back and let you talk about this. Quote, solid state of fear. Euro Boffins bust open SSD BitLocker encryption. It's really, really dumb. And then if that doesn't bring the point home, quote, security experts frantically face palming at stupid design. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so so the, the register article... It, is harping on Microsoft a lot. Um, yeah. The thing is, though, it's not completely Microsoft's fault. So the paper itself, which is linked in, uh, in near the beginning of the register article, uh, very interesting. Basically, they went through some different SSDs made by some made by Crucial, some made by Samsung. I'm not sure if they just uh -huh. had enough juice, juicy content to make a nice 
paper at that point and just stopped trying to do other SSDs or that those, you know, those two makers were the easiest to get into. But yeah, they were really freaking easy. Uh, these guys took these SSDs. In some cases, they kind of probed around and used this thing called the JTAG header, which is like a way to debug hardware. Um, you know, this assumes you have physical access to the SSD, but yeah, I mean, you're trying to get into encrypted SSD, you're going to have physical access, right? Well, these guys dumped the firmware from the drives, analyzed it, saw what made it tick, did some reverse engineering. And in a lot of these cases, there were some very simple, just, I mean, one of the most easy cases was there was just a vendor-specific command uh, which is just pure security through obscurity, right? It's uh, you're just relying on the fact that nobody would know what this super secret command is, right? And if you ran this particular kind so of, well. yeah, and if you just happen to know what this command was to send to the drive, uh, and you did so, then it would unlock another set of commands, one of which would allow you to just like extract the block of cryptographic data from the drive. In other words, like the the chunk of information that contains the things like the passwords or hashes that you would need to be able to reverse the passwords and and get access to the data and just unlock the drive. Um, yeah, I mean, just all around, there was just all sorts of holes that these guys poked. Uh, and they just systematically went through, you know, they went through three different crucial SSDs. They went through four, uh, four different Samsung SSDs, you know, very common ones, 840, 850 Evos. Uh, the T3 and the T5, which I think are the, the most damning of this whole thing, is that Samsung T3 and T5 are external SSDs. Those are the ones that users are most likely to enable the encryption on because they don't mm -hmm. want just someone coming across this drive and just being able to read it. Uh, now, granted, if your average Joe came across this drive, they're probably still not able to read it. They still need to know what the password is. But if there's somebody who knows their way around some hardware, like these guys do, and mm -hmm. have any sort of reverse engineering experience they're going to be able to figure out a way in, right? It's almost like Jurassic Park, right? Like life will find a way. Life always finds a way, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> line from the movie. It's That's how security stuff tends to work, right? Like just ask uh, Steve Gibson, you know, there's, there's someone will find a way. If there's, if there's a way in that exists, it will be found at some point. It's just a matter of time and effort, basically. Uh, and in the case of a lot of these, while these drives are all conforming to some form of a Opal standard, or and Opal is just the uh, one of the standards which you would uh, a host would communicate with an SSD and enable or disable or you know enter your password for for encryption. Uh, they can claim to conform to that standard, but if the st if the way they've implemented it is not secure. Uh, <laughs> it, it might as well it might as well not exist, right? Um, and then the part of this that that uh, Windows comes into play on is that uh, it's in relation to BitLocker. So if you had right. an SSD or a hard disk uh, connected to your system that did not support any of these cryptographic standards, any like Opal or any of those things where the drive tells the system, hey, I can do this encryption thing, right? If none of that's there, Windows will just do its own encryption. It'll have to use a CPU. On more modern systems, there's like an AES-256 engine inside, like Intel and AMD CPUs. Like there's there's commands, it's accelerated, but there's still some sort of overhead. All of your data has to pass through the CPU before it, you know, goes to and from the disk. It's a little bit extra work, which is the part of the reason you want the hardware to be able to do it, right? It's way more ideal if just the SSD can just take care of it. You give the SSD your password, it unlocks it, good. System loses power drive is protected again basically um but there's there's no mechanism to tell microsoft uh or windows hey uh i understand you could do this yourself uh i don't want you to ask the drive if it can do it and if the answer is yes just let the drive do it like i don't want you to trust the drive like with security usually the best thing is trust no one uh and in this case, you know, don't trust anything or trust as few things as possible, right? Um, so Microsoft's default in this case has just been, well, if the drive says it's Opal compatible, just, yeah, sure, do that. That's great. Um, and in an ideal world, that should be the right answer. You should be able to trust it. But as this paper proves, uh, turns out, you know, these guys haven't been that great uh, at implementing this. Um, and I, I wouldn't just, you know, 
voice caution towards uh, Crucial or Samsung here. Like any of these guys, there's probably vulnerabilities. Uh, so we were talking about this on the podcast that uh, Ken brought up a really good point. Like it's, Opal shouldn't just be like the standard that people follow. There should be some sort of a certification, right? There should be some sort of an independent body, uh, main, probably including guys like this that, that did this work. There should be somebody that can actually review in confidence the firmware or whatever the software is that's on the SSD that's responsible for handling the crypto. Uh, let someone validate that stuff. Let someone else look at your code. Um, no. You know, in a manner, in a manner of which they're not going to redistribute your code, right? And where it's kept in confidence, but there will let be someone no review it. Just trust well, us. Well, I think they really should be doing. You know, they really should be some kind of a auditing mechanism in place here. Just, you know, just to. In a lot of cases, it's it's better for uh, any company. Like if you're able to say, hey, well, I know this, this independent you're, you're, guy, like looked at you're this. And, to the choir here, I just find a lot of companies. When you suggest that perhaps they should have their products audited, look at you like you're some sort of magic space weasel that just teleported into the middle of their office and took a magic space weasel dump in the middle of their desk. It's just, I find it unfortunate. It, I also find companies that believe in security through obscurity to be unfortunate. But look, we've got some sort of, you know, uh, Venn diagram of, of security errors being found yeah. in the storage being deployed in laptops. It's not like you store important information on a laptop that you might actually want to remain secure, uh, especially in the case of government employees, organizations that are subject to uh, industrial espionage. Yeah. 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 I'm I mean, it's, you know, so it's, every, you know, th this, it's worse than I thought it, it could have been. Um, and uh, given that, and given that this paper's out now, I really hope that everybody kind of steps up their game and uh, and fixes that problem and makes it so that you should be able to trust Opal, right? You should be able to trust a drive that says that it can do encryption. Uh, and then when you flip that on, it should work and it should be it should be harder to get into than just a few security researchers poking around, <laughs> uh, you know, well, poking I mean, poking around the parts poking around the parts of the drive that are just accessible generally, right? Just like a JTAG header. Like almost every bit of computer hardware has some form of a JTAG header on it. Uh, it's, it I mean, it's not, always awkward. You know, it, it, it's not even... It, I, I'm okay with security researchers poking around and finding things because some security researchers and pen testers are extraordinarily intelligent and, talented and sophisticated. What I have an issue with is somebody downloaded the service manual and through our secret commands... <laughs> <laughs> yeah right you know yeah um, like you know so in some cases there was just uh there was just like a uh, i think they extracted it was something like one of the commands or it just like contained like the email address of one of the guys that worked at the company and then all and then a long string of numbers it was just like yeah this like is this awkward. is just this is just the way in Right, like this is if you do this, so you, you know, potentially making it so easy that in the end, once you've figured out, you might have had to use the JTAG and other kind of creative ways to to get to the point of figuring out the exploit. But then right. once you have it figured out, it's potentially so easy that it could just be run without any special tools, without <laughs> just with the drive connected to a system. You could potentially hit it with these uh, special commands that then unlock other commands that you can issue, and then just the drive just gives up the goods. It's just like, oh, you want my you want my block of flash that contains this, all the security keys for the drive? Here you go. Like, yeah, it's it's just yeah, no. that's not good, right? It's the no. same kind of thing that same kind of thing that Steve Gibson when he comes across just this thing that was just like a no brainer. Why were you guys doing it this way? Kind of thing. You just it just kind of blows your mind. Like you don't understand why, but you know, at the end of the day, some of these guys were were just trying to get this thing impl implemented. Yeah, uh, nice. I, and that, I mean that's part of the issue. Is is I, I'm in the process, you know, teaching the boys math and uh, teaching the boys to double check their answers and verify. Um, you know, is something and to give yourself the time to do that is I think critical. And it's critical when you're doing math as an 11 year old. And it's critical when you're doing hardware design. It's critical to, when you're engineering hardware implementations. And all too often, it just doesn't get done. And the end result is exciting surprises that make you realize that your secure devices aren't. And that's the kind of surprise I don't need. Yeah. And just, just going through some of these, it was just, it was to the point where the person responsible for, set, for doing the development work at that level when this thing was 
you know, being figured out. Somebody in the room had to ask that question, or it, sh it should have dawned on somebody, right? Like, well, we have this special <laughs> command. We have this special command that just lets us into this, and couldn't they just then get this other information and then reverse the password? Like, like it's there, right? It, it's it's just a feature that they had of the drive that they really should have locked that down. It's similar to the kind of things you hear about with, uh, you know, back doors into uh, what's the Intel. Uh, chipset level thing that was like ring minus two access to the hardware, the Intel management engine backdoors and whatnot, where it was just a thing that no, they never thought anybody would try to access the thing that way. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, we're just relying on the obscurity of it. Oh yeah, just nobody would ever figure this out. Well, somebody figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> so now they got to fix it. Oh my goodness. Alan's not on vacation. He's not driving a racetrack near a historical museum somewhere. I got to ask you, Alan, before we wrap up our wrap up, wrap up, what are you looking forward to in 2019? Hmm. Well, you know me. I'm always looking for like faster storage things. You know, <laughs> faster storage, faster storage, things. But younger also, processors I, and more money. I, I will, I will temper that with faster yet cheaper storage things. Right. Because, we're, you know, we, we're, we're, we, they keep, we seek the 10 yeah, cent yeah, yeah. gigabyte. <laughs> yes. Yes. We have to reach the 10 cents. Ryan's uh, infamous 10 cent per gig, uh, you know, Gold. wish, hope, whatever you want to call it. But at the same time, you can't just hit 10 cents per gig if the performance is utter crap. Right. Right. So hopefully we'll hit that. But with things that are that are actually, you know, perform reasonably well. Because uh, we can hit 10 cent per gig right now. With, with Winchester a drive. Media. In fact, actually lower. <laughs> <sighs> oh, my goodness. Spinning, spinning rust? Yeah, sure. Hey, man. Never underestimate the power of spinning rust. The utility of spinning rust. The joy mm -hmm. of spinning rust. Spinning rust, people, for all your storage needs and the long-term, low-cost realm. Oh, my goodness. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it for this episode of This Week in Computer Hardware. If this is your first show, welcome to This Week in Computer Hardware. We like to call it Twitch. And uh, you can find us on this webpage you're looking at right now, twitch.tv slash TWICH. Get information on how to subscribe on your favorite podcatcher. Or just search for This Week in Computer Hardware. Or just go to that webpage, twitch.tv slash Twitch. All the older episodes are there. You can listen until your ears collapse from the joy of or the nerdliness, whichever makes you happier, people. You can find more Alvin Malventano at the ever-so-awesome PCPer.com. You can find me at T-E-K-T-H-I-N-G.com or AVXL.com. Uh, one's about computers and stuff, and the other one's about home theater and audio. And I look forward to talking to you next year, because CES is coming, and it's going to roll over us like a happy little train. Happy little train, people. Happy little CES. Right there. A little happy little CES crushing your brain. All right, everybody. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Alan Malventano. And we'll see you next week on Twitch. <laughs>